Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the October 2022 meeting. Okay, it's not October, but it's our October meeting. Um, so let me get going. I'm late. I uh, had some technical difficulties. Um, here is a list of the board members. There's our mugs. I like to do this every month just to make sure everybody gets to see this. Um, I know I know uh, John and Matt and Trina are in the house. I have not seen Gunner tonight. Um, and Conrad is either up at uh, uh, the 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 Lake Superior or he's online here somewhere. So there's our mugs. Um, I want to start the meeting with a public service announcement. So if you are planning to attend Astronomy Day at ELO on Saturday and you plan on eating at the with the, the barbecue dinner, the barbecue supper, buy your ticket. Because there's a chance that if you don't buy your ticket and you show up and a bunch of people show up from the public that are just walk-ups, somebody's going to go home hungry or somebody's eating pizza. Maybe that's it. Um, but we're not having pizza, we're having barbecue. So if you go to the, the website and go to the event on the event calendar and scroll down a little bit, there's a buy now thing. Buy your ticket, please. I have to give it the final number tomorrow morning. So if you're here, if you're online and you can do that, get it done. Now, I will have, for those of you that are on the fence as to whether or not you're going to be there or not, I will be selling tickets on, on the premises. Um, so if it happens, it happens, I understand. But if you know for sure you're going to be there and you're going to be, want to be part of supper, then there we go. Question in the room. Careful now. Nobody can hear you, Steve. All right. Steve says that if you don't have a PayPal account, you don't need a, you don't need a PayPal account to pay on PayPal. You could just enter your credit card and pay. So don't worry about that. We're going to have, Steve's going to print a list on Saturday morning before he comes to the park. Um, so we'll have a list of everybody that's paid and then everybody else. Uh, we're going to look for some kind of proof from you that you paid. Um, kind of, you know, or if you could just show us, that'd be really cool. So, hey, the MAS is turning 50. We're having a big party tonight. We're having a big party tomorrow night. Um, we got this Apollo 11 lunar module out there at Eagle Lake. Um, Saturday is the really big party because we're having, uh, we're going to have a star party. We're going to show the public, this is what the MAS does. This is what we have been doing. We've been doing this for 50 years and, uh, you know, I'm hoping we do it for 50 more. Um, I just might not be part of it next 50, all of, all of the next 50. So there's the schedule. And there again is the warning. You better buy your ticket or else you're not going to get anything to eat. So um, it looks like a full schedule. Um, everybody keep your fingers crossed that the weather stays as is, um, at least the forecast. A little improvement could be better too, but we'll take this. And there it is again. I'm being facetious because I don't want anybody to not get fed that was planning. And it's in the newsletter. And I saw it. And it's on the website. And it's in a lot of places. All right. So we're going to con 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 conclude our 50th anniversary uh, celebration next month at the, at the monthly meeting where Do Dr. Kenneth Carpenter is going to be here to talk about Hubble stuff. That should be fun. And then my last announcement for the night, and I'll, you won't hear any more from me, um, board member nominations. I at least have to make this an announcement here. Um, the, there's three seats open, the president, secretary, and one of the board members at large. Um, Gunnar Iceberg is uh, going to be the chair. Um, he's committed to putting something up on the form, up on Slack, and, it, and we'll even work it out and get it in the newsletter too. Um, but those nominations have to close at the end of our November meeting because elections are on the, at the December meeting. So there we go. Um, so here we are. Our next meeting is here. And it will be on Zoom again. So here we are.
featured presentation. Dave Balkner and Ron Schmidt are going to take us through 50 years of uh, the MAS in 90 minutes. And then after they're done, Carol Org from uh, the Astronomical League is going to have his 45 to 50 minutes of time. Not quite that long. Oh, there will be time for plenty of cupcakes then. So those of you that are online, I don't know, I'll, we'll send you a virtual cupcake or something. I'm not sure. So, all right. Give me two seconds to get these guys switched over. Dave, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you got your microphone right there. So while he's setting that up, you already have it. Look at how good? fast he is. Man, man. I don't know. Matt broke something. You're in. You're on. Can you hear me now? Don't start that. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Come on. Is this on? Is this, is it on? Oh, we tested it before we get started. Yeah, so it's oh, on. It's Turn it up. It needs to be on. Crack, crack it up. Okay. The vagaries of the digital world. Is that board. better? There, there you go. So, Matt, what did you do to the room? Is Matt done? No presentation. That does that when we don't have a presentation. Okay. So, okay. So, so, I, yeah. so, all right. So, while we're, while we're working out the technical difficulties, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Dave Faulkner. I've, I've been a member for I don't know, about 12, 15 years or so president a couple of times, and um, uh, I'm here with Ron Schmidt. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Ron Schmidt, MAS member number 270, represent. It's here for the triple digits. All right. It's here for the double digits. Bob Rose, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Number 29, I think. Oh, my. Yeah, I know. We're that, digging. Ooh, yeah, that's good. We're that's digging really way good. back in time. So um, we're here tonight to talk. Um, uh, give you a little history of the MAS. And, I, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, and there are a lot of things that we aren't going to talk about because we just – we've only got 90 minutes, right? So but we hope that we capture at least the essence of, of our history in over the 50 years. And so uh, we get – oh, there we are. All right, excellent. Are. Okay, now – We're going to be a mile wide and an inch deep. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, talk about this tonight – uh, but uh, we're going to intermix this with uh, some some question and answers at various points from members who've been around for a while. They can give us uh, some insight, some more personal insight about certain things. Mm -hmm. So we'll just kind of figure that out. Uh, it's going to be a timeline type style. And you'll notice when you put the timeline up, which I can do right now, that the, uh, the, the top part of the timeline are, are most of the MAS type of things. And, and below the timeline, we put in some, some uh, uh, missions, some NASA things that happened to kind of give it context, to give you an idea. Okay, oh, that was happening during this time, you know. And so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the whole idea. So that's why you're going to see the stuff on the bottom to be more space NASA type stuff. And the stuff at the top is MAS type stuff. Okay, so how did this all get started? Well... Let me get this out of here. And while Dave is up here driving the bus, I'm going to wander around with the microphone. Yeah. Remember, we want to hear you online to take care of those people that are dialing in. So I'll stick the microphone in your face so we can hear you online. Sounds good. All right. So th this whole mess started in 1972. And we talked about NASA stuff in, in 1972. And we're going to celebrate this out at ELO, by the way. The, na the last Apollo mission uh, to the moon happened. Okay, Apollo 17. And I land on the moon, and uh, roughly about the same time, actually. Um, so there was there was a, a an, an astronomy club that the 3M company had. Okay, it still has, as far as I know, it's still around. I don't know. I don't know either. You probably work with companies that uh, the company will pay a certain amount to uh, support your club, and that's the kind of uh, club that came out of 3M. Yeah. So so 3M had an astronomy club, but it was restricted to employees of 3M. Okay. And some of those employees had friends who were interested in astronomy, but of course they couldn't be part of the club. So they thought, hey, you know, maybe we could start a club as well that would be open to the general public as opposed to just three of employees. And so Jim Fox is the one who kind of got this all started. And so he sent out a letter, okay? 
And he just invited people who had an interest in astronomy to come and join them at the, uh, the, the what was then the Minnesota Arts and Science Center. I believe that became the Science Museum of Minnesota. That's correct. Later on. And um, so uh, he set that up. And sure enough, they got a few people to, to, to come. Okay. So on the, the, the sheet on the right, uh, on the top portion of the people who showed up and the people on the, on the bottom are people who expressed an interest. Okay? Right up there. <laughs> yeah, you up there? Yeah, your addresses are up there too, people. Sorry. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, but do they still live there? That's, you know, well, it's, it's, it's grandfathered in, right? So, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> after a certain amount of time, it's not our responsibility. That's right. That's right. And so they got together and they, and they formed the, the, what was then called the Twin Cities Astronomy Club. Okay? Later, they would change that to Twin City Astronomy Club. But nevertheless, TCAC would be the, uh, the acronym for it. Now, if we could just pull the room for a second. Could you raise your hand if your name is up here? Bob Rose and anyone else? How about online? Could you pop something up in the chat for us so we could recognize the, the long timers who are with us tonight? I tell you, this has been a treat as we've been digging through this stuff. It's brought back a lot of memories and a lot of names and a lot of really great experiences. So uh, I hope that comes across tonight as we present this because it, it's an amazing rich history and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Okay, so they got started and um, uh, they, for the for the beginning part, um, they they would meet again at this Minnesota Arts and Science Center, and uh, their their star parties often were in conjunction with the 3M star parties because there are several 3M people who are part of this. So they 3M said, "Yeah, come on out. You know, you can you can join our star parties." And so they went out and and they uh, they had star parties with 3M. And then um, in 1974, a gentleman by the name of Father George Metcalf joined the club. And Father George Metcalf had a little slice of land out uh, not too far from Afton that was still at that time fairly dark skies. And so he said, you know, uh, we, could, we could start using my land out there. So uh, for those of you who, who may not know exactly, oops, sorry, go back, don't know exactly where it is. So uh, this is uh, out 94, a little past uh, the, uh, the Manning Road exit out there. Uh, on Indian Trail uh, Road, uh, drive, Indian Trail Drive. And so, um, uh, and it's used today. I mean, uh, I know Suresh has his B-SIG parties out there and um, they're well attended. And so it's, you know, with, you know, with Woodbury growing up, it gets a little light polluted, but it's still not a bad place. And a lot of people go out there. So we have that site today as our original site and we still have it today. Okay. Um, so he, he joined in 1974. He owned that parcel of land. It has changed ownership over the years. First star party was in June, June 21st of 1974. And then it was sold to the Science Museum for a period of time. And then eventually the Bellwin Conservancy, which we'll mention again later, uh, purchased the land and it's owned by them. Yeah, right. So I'm going to stop for a second okay. and refer to one of our founders. Bobby, you want to stand up for a second? I warned you this would happen. Bob, tell us how old were you when you signed your name to that piece of paper? 16. 16 years old. <laughs> Excellent. And so what got you connected to the MF? Um, I actually was working on telescopes um, earlier at um, McAllister in a summer school group, and I saw uh, at Sherm Fultz's and okay. saw an ad for this meeting at uh, E&W Optical. E&W Optical, hands up for anyone that remembers E&W. Hey, yep. If you Several don't, it was people. over on Hennepin Avenue. Uh, right near 280, and it was the mecca for all things telescopic yeah. until I think the 80s when it finally closed down. The 90s, it finally closed down. You closed it down? Suresh is smiling. I grabbed the last mirror, he says. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get all the way from your home to St. Paul? Mostly on the bus. On the bus, <laughs> public <laughs> transportation. I did, Andy mentioned that her name was probably Patricia. Does that sound familiar? Tell us about Patricia. Oh, Pat was a friend that I met in college, and um, we were both into telescopes. We, we ended up, it was really funny, we were sitting in a computer science class together and started talking about telescopes, and I just mentioned that I made one, and she didn't believe me, so I had, had to show her, you know, but it turned out we were actually born on the same day. Nice. <laughs> nice. And we're still friends. Still friends. That's fantastic. Thanks, Dave. You bet. You Thanks, bet. Thanks, Bob. 
All right. So uh, moving along the timeline here, uh, the next thing is of, of interest is that the first Gemini was actually published. Okay, and here's, here's the cover of the first Gemini from the Twin City Astronomy Club. Okay, and had an article there about uh, Charles Spencer. All right, so, okay, so there's that. And mostly through the 70s, it was just kind of getting things going, you know, meeting, organizing, having star parties and stuff. Let's throw it over to the current editor of Gemini, Father Brown. Thank you so much for your years of service. How long have you been editor with Gemini now? The October issue that finished is 15 years. 15 years. Fantastic. 15 years. 15 Fantastic. Years. Excellent. And if you belong, if you are uh, also, if you watch other astronomy clubs, or maybe you're affiliated with some other astronomy clubs, you can tell that we've got a top-notch newsletter. It is fantastic. Well done, sir. Yeah, one of the things that Father Brown uh, is, is very proud of is that all the articles that are in the newsletter have ever been in the newsletter, as long as he's been an editor at least, have been from members of the society. We don't, we don't gather information from outside the club and put it in there. They're all member stuff member supply stuff. Okay, so let's, it gets us up to about 1980. And in 1980, uh, there's a decision made that, you know, they really wanted to incorporate and make the, the, the uh, uh, Twin Cities Astronomy Club a, a nonprofit organization. And so they, they drew up and they changed the name of it to the uh, Minnesota Astronomical Society. There we there we go. There we go. Okay. Now, who knows why they changed the name to the Minnesota Astronomical Society? Hmm? Exactly. There was other Twin City Astronomy Clubs. I know of one for sure down in Illinois. It's called Twin City Astronomy Club. And they didn't want to be confused with some of the other Twin City Astronomy Clubs. And so they changed the name to the Minnesota Astronomical Society. And that's how we got our name. Okay. And they, um, okay, so there's that. And uh, they have a list of members there. We're not going to go ahead and list that. And then um, shortly after that, it became, uh, 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 we, we, we became aware of the fact that the University of Minnesota Duluth was, had a telescope that they were interested in selling to us. Okay. Uh, this, this was a, uh, uh, a, a rather uh, sizable scope of 16 inches, weighed like a thousand pounds, okay? And uh, it, was, it was called a 16-inch a Group 128 Cassegrain Telescope, okay? And uh, Bill Larson was the one who was kind of negotiating with them and, and did all the back and forth on that. And eventually we secured that telescope. We purchased it. I, I don't know how much we paid for that. It's... I, 6K, yeah. 6K, $6,000. Okay, so we, we bought this monster. Now, our club has If a you're habit. feeling triggered, hold on. It'll be over shortly. <laughs> our, <laughs> our, our club has a habit of, of getting large telescopes with no homes and then finding a home for them, okay? Uh, we, we, th this was the first one because we got this telescope and then it it sat for 20 years before we actually had a home for it, an observatory to put it in. So, uh, but this is, this was it. We had it. Okay. Um, uh, in 1981, we actually hosted the North Central Region Astronomical League Convention. Okay. Don't have many pictures from that or anything, but uh, apparently it was successful. And then again, through the 80s, we were... Um, looking at uh, what, where we might be able to put this Larson telescope. And uh, Baylor Regional Park, we, we actually um, cultivated a relationship with them and started having star parties there. Now, this would just be with, with uh, member-owned telescopes. And, um, but we, we felt as though maybe that would be a place for it. So by 19, late 1986, we actually signed a lease with Carver County for a future observatory, okay? I don't think there's any kind of timeline put to that. It was just kind of an understanding. And just a reminder, for those of you who've gone out to Baylor, this is long before any construction. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no construction at all. Nope. No, just, uh, there was just a hill there, <laughs> right? <laughs> just a hill where they put the telescopes up, okay? And that continued on. And then in the 1990s, we're gonna go to the next, next decade here, 
And in the 1990s, things started really happening, okay? Um, so uh, they started negotiating. There was two other areas that became of interest to the, the Minnesota Astronomical Society. One was called Wilder Forest uh, area that was out by Marina and St. Croix. And they, they really thought that um, this might be a, a potential spot for an observatory. And they started some very serious negotiations with the Wilder Forest folks. Uh, in addition, um, a gal by the name of uh, Leanne uh, uh, Ronan, I think was the name, um, down at, at, outside of, of Cannon Falls had a plot of land that she said she, you know, we, we could use as, as a Minnesota Astronomical Society. I had a little bit of problems, though, with insurance and life because it was privately owned land. And then we came to find out in 1992 that there was a plot of land that was formerly the Cherry Grove School that became available for sale. And it was very, very good price. And so we purchased that land and it became the Cherry Grove property, eventually the observatory. So for those of you who don't know where it is, we have Cannon, hang on a second, Cannon Falls up here. And it's pretty much south of Cannon Falls, about 20 minutes, I'd say. Let's pull a room quick. How many of you have observed from Cherry Grove? How many of you have gone down to Cherry Grove with your telescopes? Yeah. Excellent. Right. So that's probably about 80% at least. Maybe yeah. 90%. Any online folks, go ahead and pop a, pop a note in the chat. Let us know. Okay. It was the premier dark sky site. It was. <laughs> it was. And, uh, but it was, it was kind of rough going at the beginning. Um, so, uh, when we, uh, when we got the property, um, uh, it turned out that 3M had an observatory and warming house that they were going to replace. And so they gave the old warming house and the old observatory to the Minnesota Astronomical Society, and it was transported down to Cherry Grove and they had to clean up the property. Now, who all was involved with cleaning up the property down at Cherry Grove? Anybody here? Vic, were you, were you part of that? Ben. Not that picture. No, no, I came in later. Yeah, you, know, you were you, you, you helped clean it up. Ben was. Ben, okay. Ben, what'd you do there, Ben? Uh, just general uh cleanup. They had this sort of steps that went to the uh, schoolhouse, and the schoolhouse had long since uh, gone away and burned down or something, and just sort of trying not to step on boards with uh, nails and clear weeds and stuff like that. So now My this facility was over at Tartan Field, right? This one was, yeah. Tartan Park? Yeah, that, somewhere. That was 3M's yeah, site along, in which they would do uh, observing. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, sorry about that. Somewhere along the line, I had read that um, that warming house, if anybody remembers in the early 2000s, all of the windows had screens on them, you know, like the metal screens. And it was because I heard it at one point, it was the caddy shack at the golf center at Tartan Park. Nice. Nice. Yeah. What was at Cherry Grove before? That was the school. Well, actually, before the school. Uh, oh, okay. It was, uh, according to an article that I read in the Gemini, that it was actually an auto repair place and kind of a dump type of place. Okay. And so as a result, when they were cleaning up the place, they came across metal parts right and left as they were kind of cleaning up the spot and digging into the ground a little bit. And <laughs> still... And Trina, who is the current uh, site coordinator, said that they still do uh, run into some metal parts if they go digging into the ground uh, any length at all. So it, it was it was pretty rough at first. I know they had to clean out a bunch of weeds and stuff, um, and so uh, uh, and and get it all cleaned up. And then, of course, again we have an observatory down there, and we needed a telescope for it. And so Sherm Schultz, whom we've already mentioned here. Uh, donated a 16-inch Newtonian telescope that was on what was called an English equatorial mount. And so um, he, he donated that. He had uh, he, put it together, and uh, it was there for a number of years. My understanding, though, and Steve, uh, I've heard this from you, was that uh, the collimation of it was a, a bit tough. Uh, uh, Mark, you want to come back to Steve here for a minute? <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, Sherm Schultz had put a cassegrain hole in the middle of the thing. So try to do a uh, laser collimation or even, you know, the sight tube collimation with something with a hole in the middle of it. 
a little difficult. Actually, at one point, I got pretty good at uh, doing collimation via, you know, looking at the star. A star um, collimation, I think, oh, yeah. Uh, Vic has some other stuff he wants sure, to see sure. about that thing, too. You have to remember that when that scope was donated, we didn't have lasers. We didn't have lasers. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Before the lasers. Michael Copper online points out that he hauled... Uh, loads of cinder block in his 12 passenger van oh there you go just cleaning up the place yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah he had exactly. A hand in it. exactly all right so this this was the telescope that was down there for a while uh in the observatory and then eventually in in 2003 i believe it was we got the 24 inch star master uh big aperture aperture yes job. aperture okay um, yes, so um, it was known by other names, but that's what we're going to call it today. So um, uh, we purchased this, actually purchased this uh, Star Master, and it's down there today. Uh, still works great. And uh, it's the third largest telescope now that the MAS has, because there's a 30-inch and a 25-inch up at uh, LLCC. We'll get to that eventually. Okay. And then um, eventually uh, th th we have- Hold on, Dave. Oh, Ben's oh. got something about the oh, yeah. big aperture. Dogs. I'm just curious, is there anybody here who went on the a road trip to go get that uh, telescope still? Dick Jacobson. Dick Jacobson? Okay. Dick Jacobson. When got to tell, yeah, where, where was where, it? Where was it? Washington State. Washington State. Oh, there's a road State. trip. I, okay. There's a road trip. That is a road trip. <laughs> All right, so what is this station of wagon with which you speak? <laughs> so eventually the 16-inch uh, Newtonian was replaced by a 14-inch LX200 donated by Father Brown, I believe. And uh, it replaced the 16-inch in that observatory and was used for a number of years as well. Okay. This is what uh, Cherry Grove looked like in 2011. I want you to take a really good look at this picture because I'm going to show you a picture a little bit later where it's going to look a lot different than this, okay? So, but uh, the trees, you may think, oh, man, it, it blocked, you know, blocked the sky. Actually, the trees were kind of nice because the largest light dome we had was the Twin Cities to the north, and the trees kind of blocked that. So that was, that was kind of nice. And, you know, north objects eventually circled around on top anyway so you know you get to them eventually um here we this is a 2011 so we have uh you know the old observatory the old warning house there on the right we have the uh shed that the uh, dob was stored in and the dob is out there we just kind of rolled it out and, and put it up and then behind the shed is a uh, storage shed and behind that was the outhouse that we had down there for a number of years okay Right, and here, here's a, uh, a star party that was held in 2011. The other thing that we what we did down there was we we rigged up a system of of, uh, of tarps that could be put out with PVC poles, right? Because uh, right behind there was the intersection of uh, Dodge County A and Goodhue County One, and there was enough traffic, and you get headlights that uh, it was kind of nice to have some sort of light block there from the headlights, and so that's what those tarps were used for, and we set them up. Okay, and uh, we still have those today too, of course. All right, so that that was kind of the beginning of of Cherry Grove, and then um, they were still wrestling with the whole uh, Wilder Forest versus versus Baylor as far as the site for the observatory, and they they ran into some negotiation problems with Wilder, and the board board finally said you know, let's just go with Baylor. And so they decided to go with Baylor as the site for the new observatory. And there was a campaign that was put on to raise some funds for that. And eventually um, it was laid in 1998. In the meantime, there were a couple of other sites that were advertised in the Gemini as official MAS observing sites. One was Onamia, which uh, I never knew about, but this Onamia site was up there just south of Lake Mille Lacs. And what was up there was the Mille Lacs Academy had an observatory with a 16-inch telescope. And we worked with, I believe it's the North Star Astronomy Club, 
to refurbish that telescope. And uh, the monks who ran the school, uh, in exchange for us refurbishing the telescope, allowed us to use that site as an observing site for uh, from 1992. And then in 1995, just kind of fell out of favor. So we, uh, we didn't use that site anymore. Um, and then the other site that was used for a, quite a number of years was the BB Park site. And that's a BB Regional Park, which is, uh, here's, here's Buffalo out here to the right. So you can kind of get an idea of where it is. And um, Mark Job says that he's, he's been to BB Park, right? He's been out there a couple of times. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's on and, my way here. And so um, uh, from April 1995 through August 1999, that was a site that was listed also in the Gemini as an official observing site. So we, uh, we had that site out there. All right. Has anybody used the BB site in here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ben. Hold on, Ben. Oh, anemia had a real interesting uh, structure in that they roll off a rough, did not roll uh, horizontally, but on a uh, diagonal. Oh, <laughs> all right. Very good. Rolled on a diagonal. Okay. Right. Okay, so finally, um, we, we, we pulled it all together. And in 1998, uh, or late 1997, we started building the, the Onan Observatory. So here's, uh, we're going to have a few slides here. The, there's a, a, a large number of uh, pictures about building this. I've selected a few, but I think we could probably talk about it. So here's, here's the, the, the forms here for laying the foundation for the, for the site. Uh, ben, you're out here. There you go. And uh, starting to build the walls up for the, for the uh, observatory. And then, um, th then we started assembling the, the, the arts sections. Uh -huh. Okay. Hey, and let me stop just a second here. And let me pitch it over to one of the board members at the time, Gibson Batch. If you've not get met Gibson, he was around on the board at this time. And Gibson, what can you remember about securing Onan? I have so many tales, but I was, I, I was treasurer at the time and you had mentioned fundraising and the club had 150 members and I personally called every one of you. <laughs> and I needled you really badly and we got the money we needed. And then Onan stepped forward with a $25,000 grant. Um, they make uh, power supplies, um, and uh, that's why it's called the Onan. I helped, um, you know, I got the $25,000 check mailed to me so before we deposited, so it was pretty exciting. And then, and then, uh, yeah, we put this together section by section. They had, um, remember this? They had, the, the, the masonry was done by a school, and it wasn't done all that well. <laughs> <laughs> And nothing quite lined up. Yeah, they, they worked with Hennepin Tech, and it was a student project. They got students to help with the foundation. And then the arches. And if any of you, I see Dave Olmsted there, Dave Ronkel, uh, get another drill bit was a common refrain because that metal was a lot harder than they thought it was. Dave Olmsted, who I got to talk to in preparation for this meeting, uh, actually got interested in the club because of the construction. What a saint. <laughs> it's like um you, you gotta tell us no it's just, you, you, you do any observing no any imaging no 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 i can drill a hole hey get it <laughs> i love that so dave was very instrumental in the construction of, of the uh onan right of course after you put the arches together we've got some more here. okay then of course you got to put them up right right there. Oh, yeah the arches, the arches, the first one took us six hours to make, and by the end, we were putting them up in 15 minutes. Oh, that's, 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 that's called progress. All right. All right. So we're, um, so that's start, baby start, bear, by the way, baby if you bear. can't tell. Yep. Yeah, let's start out with baby bear, and uh, they kept putting it together, and uh, here we have it just, just about done. All, all putting those sections together. How long did it take? To put the roof together. That's what I want to know. 17, 18 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I do remember, I do remember that the company that makes this material called us a few times going, you're going to do what? Because that's on rollers. This is rolling. And that was a foreign concept to them. So pretty exciting.
No. From the row. Nelson, what was his first thing? Who the who the architect was who did this? Anybody online know? Can you feed it in the chat? There you go. All right. So then, of course, we finally have a home for the Larson, right? So we put the Larson now into the observatory. Well, it, you know, it's got an Orion, uh, an Orion uh, uh, dew shield, I think, on it. That's that's no. No, that's not the Larson. Ben knows. Here you go, Ben. Why, why is uh, it on the Larson mount? that we put together? Yeah, because that's not the a scope. That that is just the amount we couldn't get the scope on the pier in time, so we borrowed a scope just to mount onto it. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah, that's All a right. kludge. Looks like a ten-inch job. Dave Runkles, there you go. Oh, there you go. Twelve and a half. Sorry, sorry. Let the record show. Twelve and a half. All right. Here's the here's the uh, the uh, plaza out front, partially partially assembled. Right, got all the cement in and a few of the bricks. All right, and then finally we have it completed. Yay! Okay. Oh, I had to add a driveway though. So they added a driveway and eventually. I don't think it was at the same time, though. That's several years later, I believe. Much later, yeah. So it's but mostly a dirt road up there for a while. And there's the motley crew that put it together. So by the way, have we as we have unearthed these pictures, we're finding spots for them online. So if you want to go ahead and peruse the hundreds that we couldn't include, they will be out there for your viewing pleasure. Oh yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of pictures out there. Okay. All right, so that's what I have for the Onan so far. Now, there's, there's going to be a part two later on, but uh, that's what we are. And then uh, along about 1999, we had the first MAS Messier Marathon. Okay, and then moving on to the next decade into the 20s. Uh, so like I said, the Larson Scope was actually installed in 2000, and that's when we had our first public star party out there with the new observatory. Um, and then uh, I mentioned already in 2003 that the 24-inch bad was purchased for uh, for uh, Cherry Grove, and then um, in the 2005-2006, um, the Larson. I, there's no easy way to say this. It was just a bear of a telescope to operate. Okay, it took at least two people to operate it, and um, and. <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry. As as is the tradition when you talk about the operation of the Larson, everyone must say, "Lock me, Barb." Oh, <laughs> you didn't do it together. I'm a little embarrassed. Let's try again, everybody. Lock, Lock me, Barb. Lock. So as you saw, if you want to back up a slide, the uh, RA axis, no, the deck axis. The deck axis was on the far end, and. You, you couldn't reach the locking mechanism from the eyepiece. So you had someone on the other end to lock it down for you. And it was kind of a little wheel with some handles on it. Am I messing things up, Dave? Yeah, a little bit. Hang on, online people are. are I was trying to get back to the actual picture. Having some. Having oh, we're at 2020. No. Yeah. Okay, so there was a bit of a handles on there. And then as they would lock it, it would push a little bit. And now you're off target. And it's like, okay, unlock it. Okay, okay, bring it back. Okay, lock it slowly, slowly. Okay, no, too much. Okay, unlock it, try it again. Okay, now just barely this time. Okay, good, we're on. Oh, it's slipping. Okay, you got, <laughs> and that was just for one object. <laughs> and imagine doing that all night long. So, we had the uh, the donation of two 14-inch uh, Celestrons and a 16-inch Meade LX200. Not at the same time. The, the, I think the two 14-inch uh, were first, and then the Meade came on later. Uh, this is actually a more recent shot because originally we had a tripod for the two uh, Celestrons, and later on... You can tell it's a long time ago. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Space hey. Gandalf doesn't have his hair down yet, so... His superpowers in the locks. So you might ask, 
What hither? The Larson scope. It was sold to the city of Eden Prairie for a dollar because on money had to change hands. And it sat in some guy's garage for five years while they tried to build up enough funds to give it an observatory. A, re a recurring refrain with the Larson scope. Yeah. It got replaced with, oh, let's see. Oh, an LX200 made. Just a couple of years ago, the Larson got replaced with an LX200 Mead, and the Larson got shipped to Tower State Park. Tower, Minnesota. Yep, Tower, Minnesota. That's where they have the mine that goes down. You can you get a ride down the mine shaft. And guess what? It's sitting it's in, in some garage. guy's garage <laughs> until they can earn enough money to build an observatory. Yeah, Mark, back to you. Go ahead. Oh, you wave like that. I call to you. So. Okay, Shresh has got something to say, though. Wait, wait, wait. Four places, UMD, Baylor, Starring Lake, and now Tower. We would hey. not, we, I would not be surprised if someplace owned it before UMD. By the way, it didn't last at UMD for long. Exactly. So I explored that a little bit. The body of the telescope on the inside, the metal frame, is made of magnesium. So it's nice and lightweight. All right, you nerds, crank it up. What metal expands more than magnesium? <laughs> uh, so you could collimate it to death, and it would never stay collimated. As the temperature would change, your view would change. In fact, on the Larson, there used to be these knobs up front. They didn't make it to the owning construction apparently. But if you look at a group 128 scope online, you'll see these knobs up at the front that were there to compensate for the growing and shrinking of the frame while you're observing. And no, no one ever had a good experience with a group 128 scope. We got a call from a guy in Texas. Hey, we've got this telescope in a garage. It got donated. We're gonna save up some money for an observatory. And I said, put down the phone, Sell it on Craigslist and don't look back. <laughs> He's very enthusiastic, so God bless him. Lock him, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then um, uh, somewhere between the donation of those two telescopes, John Dobson visited us. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know who John Dobson is, he is the creator of the Dobsonian-style telescope, Newtonian's telescope. He would do... Uh, literally sidewalk astronomy on the streets of San Francisco. And he would show like the moon and the planets, what you could see from the city, right? Thanks, man. Um, I'm singing that theme song in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> so John Dobson was a Vendatin monk, took a vow of poverty, and it, but still had a desire for exploring the heavens. So he used scrap construction material, a ship's portal for the mirror to grind it down. And... Um, started to do that online, started, not online, started to do it in workshops. And that construction style went everywhere because it's very easy, very simple. All the money you spend on it, you spend in your optics. So you can get a great view. As long as you make everything tight enough, it doesn't shake. Awesome. I can't imagine, what was, what was the thread recently? How much are they charging for one of those Dobbs now? So companies got a hold of that idea, and they started to offer them, Orion, Mead, Celestron. Hey, a Dobsonian telescope, they're awesome. They're super cheap. And, and now there was one offered, I think it was $800, $900. Well, the bigger ones, uh, you can still get 8, eight and 10 inch for around three to 400, which is still a lot. Now, this was the, the most recent edition, and I oh, thought right John would be turning in his grave if he saw that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the other cool thing. cash for cash. Of course, the other cool thing is that then some people got you know pretty uh, pretty ingenious with it, and they just said, well, rather than having a solid tube, we let's 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 just use struts to mm -hmm. support the upper carriage uh, where the uh, where the uh, focuser is and all that, and then we can break it down to three three pieces, and you can have a bigger mirror then because we all like bigger aperture, right? That's what it's all about, and it's still pretty easy to transport. I have seen literally. 20, 24 inch telescopes to halt in the back of a hatchback because mm -hmm. they can break it down. Okay. So interesting insight from John Dobson. When he was here, he had, uh, he, we brought him up to Eisenhower. He gave a little talk to some of the members, Eisenhower Observatory and Hopkins. 
Uh, we've got the library stored there. We've got a classroom space, so it was available. So we grabbed that on a weekend. And then he gave a talk one night. Yep. Yep. And then he, he went out to Baylor. And I thought this was very interesting. You could still see the signature in yes. Mama Bear on the yep. wall. But he walked into the, to Mama Bear, looked around. And the very first thing he said is, where's all the people? Gives you an idea of where his heart for astronomy is. Right. Right downtown. The streets of San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was John Dobson's visit. Yeah. If you go out to, to the next time you got to own it, if you haven't seen it, it's it's in Baby Bear, uh, you know, on the on the east wall. You'll, you'll see his, his signature up there. Mama Bear. Yeah, we haven't talked about Mama Bear, Baby Bear. Yeah. Merle's waving. Hi, Mark. Are you over there? Where'd Mark go? I there you go over there against the wall. We have lots of seats here, but Merle prefers to stand. I was going to say that if you want to see John Dobson's presentation that he gave at the Science Museum, I did record it, and there's a DVD at Onan that you can um, view it. Oh, fantastic. If only we had an online video yeah, yeah. archive. We will, uh, now that we know about that, we'll, we'll make sure that gets up onto our... our uh, For those of you at home, Mark was just making the high sign. Oh, I'll take care of that. <laughs> Good man. Okay. Uh, then, move along here, get New Horizons launched, uh, Pluto demoted. And then uh, we get to the LLCC agreement being signed. Okay. So who do we have here who's on the Dark Sky Committee? Anybody here? You were? Okay. I talked, so <laughs> so I, I, I did talk to John Marchetti and, and to um, uh, Greg Halbrick, uh, but of course, the Dark Sky guys, they're down at Okie Text right now, so uh, <laughs> doing their thing. So uh, you want to tell us a little bit uh, about the, the search for the Dark Sky? I mean, don't go into a lot of detail, but, you know, just what, what was the idea here? Well, the idea was simply that we were seeing the light dome increasing down at Cherry Grove. We wanted to have a nice dark northern sky site. So uh, Greg Hobrick really was pushing it. Uh, I kind of tagged along with it and we came up with some ideas for it. The first thing was he saw the Audubon Society, which is a little bit south of San, uh, Sandstone. And the trouble is, it turns out it was a nice field, but there's a little bit of light from Sandstone and a whole lot of light from the Hinkley, uh, Grand it's, Casino Hinkley. Sure, sure. So one thing uh, I'll that's about all I have on it. But one thing I did notice when I was perusing through all of the Geminis, 1995, there was a star party at LLCC. There was, in fact. After. Now, I was on the board when we set up the relationship with LLCC in the early 2000s. And I had no knowledge of that. I thought that was really weird when it came up in the Gemini. I think that uh, probably the uh, entire uh, leadership up there changed over by that time. Uh, and from what I understand, they actually. You know, they, they, they wanted to get a site up in that area. And so they sent out, uh, they, they went to the, to the various newspapers out there and were able to get some sort of advertisement out there saying, hey, you know, explaining who the MAS was, you know, what we do and what we were looking for, for a dark sky site. And we got responses back. Uh, several of them we, we dismissed as being uh, either too light polluted because they were still too near towns and stuff. The Audubon was one that we did look at. Of course, we had that problem. And Long Lake also responded back, and and they said that, hey, you know, um, we're interested in this. And so we started that conversation and eventually came up with the agreement that we that we got uh, with with uh, Long Lake. Um, so um, we got that agreement signed, and the following spring we had our first uh, first star party up there uh, on the weekends. Before we head off from LLCC, notice that line at the top of presidents. And if you've been watching the last few slides, Mike Kibbett's name has been up there a couple of times. Ben Husett's name has been up there a couple of times. Yep. Your host, Dave Faulkner's name has been up there a couple of times. No, you guy, will be. could put your name up there a couple of times. Absolutely. Because we are looking for candidates. Right. Okay. And just like you should pay for your barbecue meal right now, you'll be reminded of that quite a bit tonight. All right, Dave. All right. So uh, after we got our dark sky site, we got the agreement with LLCC. Then we had a very nice donation of the 30-inch Obsession telescope for up at LLCC, which um, how many have, have looked through that telescope? 
Um, not quite half the room. Let me tell you something. You need you need to make a trip up there and look through that telescope. It is amazing. Okay, uh, we we've seen some uh, spectacular sights through that. You know, we've seen um, Stefan's Quintet. Um, we've seen you know, of course, the planets and things are just ridiculous to them. They're they're great. All right, and then uh, a year later in uh, two thousand eight, we had uh, two firsts. We had the we had first. It wasn't called Camping with the Stars the first time, though. It was, it was called, it was something that was advertised by Sky and Telescope. And Merle, you, you really know more about this. And, and maybe you could tell a little bit, how did the first, it was called Camp Out with the Stars, if I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, the first um, Camp Out with the Stars was in 2008. And I was on the board at the time. And we were having a, uh, a board meeting and somebody brought their astronomy magazine. And they had a, um, an ad in the uh, magazine for the Camp Out with the Stars. And there was uh, a list of uh, astronomy clubs across the country, uh, 10, 12 astronomy clubs. And we were one of them. And that was the first any of us had heard of that. Um, so we, um, you know, of course, we had the site, we had the observatory, we had a campground. Uh, available to us. So uh, we kind of decided that, yeah, sure, we can go ahead and put this together in 30 days. Uh, so we did. Uh, and it worked out so well that we just kept it going. So we changed the, changed the name to Camping with the Stars because we didn't want any legal trouble. So uh, Camp Out with the Stars was done. That was a one and done. Uh, but our Camping with the Stars uh, just completed 15 years. Uh, this past year. Thanks, Merle. And that was at uh, Eagle Lake Observatory. And of course, uh, about that same time, we got a very generous donation. Remember, the largest telescope that we have at Eagle Lake at that time was the 16-inch uh, LX200. And then we were given this 20-inch. Uh, we were loaned, I think. This is yeah, exactly. So a yeah. lovely gentleman came to the board and he said, I'd like to store my 20 inch obsession out there. Can I do that? And we consulted with many of the lawyers and the hand ringers and the bean counters and such. And we came back with, yeah, no, it's a liability. And so what did that lovely gentleman tell us? Well, I, I was told that if I gave it to the club, then I could store it there. And if I had, and I was a key holder, so I could come out there anytime and use it. There you go. There you go. So we had a win-win. So that was Father Brown who donated that telescope and thus it's moniker El Padre. It is moniker El Padre, as a fact. Uh, it is the largest telescope that we have at Eagle Lake Observatory and the fourth largest telescope in the club. So very nice. Thank you very much, Father, for that. Okay. Uh, and then, we got to the first Northern Night Star Fest in 2008 as well, up at Long Lake Conservation Center. And that, uh, you know, the, the nice thing about Long Lake um, is that it's it's got the, the facilities. I don't know if I, do I have? I guess I don't have a picture of that. I thought I did, but it's got the facilities, you know, to, to stay overnight, they got bunk houses, they have a mess hall. It, it's the facility itself, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, is owned and operated by kind of a combination of county and state. And they bring in uh, uh, middle school kids to stay for uh, usually three days and two nights uh, to do some nature immersion. And so they have bunk houses, they have full you know, restroom facilities and showers and all that. Plus they have uh, a mess hall there as well. So uh, when we go up during the weekends, uh, we're able to use the, the, the bunk houses, so to speak. Uh, we, the mess hall is closed for us, but uh, we just go out in town, get food. And then we have the Northern Night Star Fest, which uh, they, they do have mess hall available for us. That's a really great event. And we have actually attracted a group from Green Bay who comes over regularly every year now every year. To, uh, to, to join us. If I get a show of hands, how many people have observed from LLCC? Ridiculously dark? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now keep your hand up if that's the darkest sky you've ever observed from. Okay, yeah. I heard of man. Okay, Trina, we hear you. Hot shot. Uh, yeah, Utah. Okay, okay. 
Hey, Dave Faulkner, that's not the darkest place you've ever observed from. No, you're probably right. Oh, yeah, you're right. North Dakota is. Never mind. There you go. I haven't been there yet, but I will be in, Dece in December. Too soon, Dean. Too soon. He's still nursing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then in, in the beginning of the, of the 2010s, we started a... Uh, Another building. So uh, once again, we, we we got some large telescopes donated to us. We have no place to put them. So we had to make a place for them. Okay. So um, uh, the first thing we got was this 10-inch refractor, TMB refractor, beautiful telescope. Uh, I think it's the second largest refractor in the state. I think it's a U of M 10 and a half inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, we, we have the second largest refractor in the state. And it is a beautiful telescope, but we had no place to put it. So we were able, so the, uh, uh, there was a nice donation. Ooh, sorry. One thing, nice donation. And uh, with some sweat equity, we, uh, we built something. So it's, it's located, so here's the Bellwin Conservancy again, right? We mentioned them before. They own Metcalf, but they, that's just a small plot of land in hand. Their main facility is a little farther east of that. And, um, uh, just off Stagecoach Road there. And then uh, if you, but the, the, the observatory is not there. The observatory is there. Okay, you have to go up a, a gravel road up the hill uh, and there's a education center there. And then just a, a, about know, maybe hundred feet away is the observatory itself. Okay. And so um, we had, uh, there's more to that, hang on. Okay, I guess not. And how many have you observed from J.J. Casby? The one site where you need to sit through an orientation in order to become a, a viewer there. I had, I had some slides, that, some pictures that apparently didn't get in here, and I, I apologize for that. But we spent, how was it a winter building that? So the winter of, of uh, uh, 2010, uh, uh, Merle was heavily involved in this, in uh, building the observatory. And uh, we... We we the MAS built that, uh, not not a contractor, and um, and then and then equipped it uh, with the, with the ten inch. And uh, there's a lot of people who worked on that, and uh, we we appreciate all the work that was done on that. And it turned out to be a great facility. It's uh, now holds holds the uh, the ten inch TMB along with um, a five inch five inch. No, that's five inch out there. It's four inches in SA Cavity, so it's five inch. And then uh, there's also the uh, the hydrogen alpha, which is a 100, it's 80, 80, 80 hydrogen alpha, which is used uh, by by the uh, people of 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 uh, Bellwin as part of their their education because the kids come during the day. A lot of times they'll they'll use the hydrogen alpha to show them the sun during the day. So it's really nice. And if I could put a name on this one, one of our founding fathers, Andy Fraser, was instrumental in uh, producing the. J.J. Casby over at the Bell one. He lives on that end of town. So yeah, yeah. And he then, was one of the three M guys. And 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 uh, John Heyman, uh, while he wasn't uh, part of that, he's he's uh, kind of runs it now and has done a great job doing that over the past several years. So mm -hmm. uh, it's been it's been really great. Okay, so then um, a few years later, we had the eight inch that was donated. And so we had to build a Sylvia Casby Observatory. Now this is located at Onan, excuse me, at Eagle Lake Observatory. We'll get to Eagle Lake Observatory in just a minute. Uh, we haven't we haven't mentioned that yet. We've only mentioned really at Onan Observatory. So the SA uh, Observatory was built again. Uh, materials donated, but sweat equity was was used to to build it. And um, uh, here's Dave Olmstead here. He's, he's Mr. Outside. Construction. Yeah. He's in, he's into construction, and uh, Merle and, and Dave actually spent uh, an entire winter working on this thing. Uh, here's here's part of the work that they did here. Not just working, but they were shacked up in baby. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They lived there. Yeah, for it was a two cot apartment. And um, yeah, so here's here's the here's the the dome ring on SA Casby that they did. You know, if you see this, uh, you, you can imagine the same thing with JJ Casby, just a little bit bigger. Okay, so. So they're putting the dome together here, and then eventually it was lifted on. So we have that. And there we got near completion. They got the roof on it now, all that. 
And then we have the equipment inside. That's the eight inch TMB with the four inch as uh, stellar view. And um, the 12 inch uh, Mulan that was also donated. So, and now there is a uh, six inch um, hydrogen alpha that has been added to this as well. So we've been very blessed with having some very, very, very nice. And if you're at home doing the math, and I hope you are, there's an incredible amount that goes into donations like this. And so when you hear of these people that donate, you know, give them a little tip of the cap because it's all for the benefit of our organization. And there have been some, I, I won't say stellar, but there have been some <laughs> amazingly generous donations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Our club wouldn't be what it is today were it not for the donations that have been made of all the telescopes yep, that we have. That's true. I, I counted it up. And when I counted it up a number of years ago, we had like, I think including the loaner program, we had like 30 telescopes that the club owned. So, oh, almost as many as Shuresh. <laughs> so, once we got the second observatory up there, what do you call it? You call it an observatory? Well, we have the Sylvia yeah, Casby Observatory, too. We can't do that. So we, we took a, uh, uh, you know, a lead from places like Kitt Peak, for instance, which is a Kitt Peak Observatory, but of course there's not one observatory there. There's like, I don't know, 24 observatories on Kitt Peak, all separate. So we thought, okay, well, we need to rename our Baylor site uh, to be something that includes the Cilia Casby Observatory and the, and the Onan Observatory, and as we'll see in a minute, the hotspot classroom as well. And so uh, after, uh, you know, kind of, kicking around a couple of ideas. We went out to the, uh, to the membership and we came back with Eagle Lake Observatory, Eagle Lake being the lake that is uh, uh, adjacent to the park there. So in fact, you can see it easily from, from the observatory. So that's how Eagle Lake Observatory, the name came, okay. So now we have it here. I've lost my video, audio from you guys. You did. We didn't lose yours. Can you hear us now? Uh, it may be at his end. It, yeah. Well, this is kind of an interesting question. <laughs> if you're not hearing, then you're not hearing my question. But is there anybody else? Can, can, can somebody hear us? And please just note it in the chat for us before it goes crazy. Okay. All right. We do have people who can hear. So um, this would be... Uh, Try to log off and log back on. Yeah. So uh, Eagle Lake Observatory is located just about three miles north of Norwood, Young America, off Highway 212 there. Um, and uh, a number of you have been out there. You know exactly where it is uh, in the Baylor Regional Park. So, uh, yeah. So, and that's what it looks like kind of today. All right. Pretty much. Uh, we've got a new railing up. So, <laughs> it's just shaking his head. But we have we have the three buildings there. Okay, and then uh, the hotspot classroom was built approximately just just. Boy, this is really frustrating. I can't can't hear anything. Uh, somebody needs to text him that. Uh, you know. I lost my audio. Yeah. Any clues on how to get my audio back? At least half of it. They can hear me. I think. All right. Well, anyway, um, so we have a few few shots here of of building the hotspot classroom um, and finishing it off in the interior. And of course, that's what it looks like today. So the the reason why. Um, we felt we needed to build the classroom. We used to have our presentations in Onan Observatory. Uh, Onan Observatory has kind of three sections to it. Baby Bear, which was the, the enclosed part that was heated. Uh, people could stay there if they stayed there overnight. Had a couple of uh, bunks in there. Uh, then they had Mama Bear, which was a section in between. And then there was Papa Bear, which is the area that the roof actually rolled off of and that exposed the telescopes to the sky. And we used to have our presentations in Baby Bear. We had some benches in there. 
and we could seat about 30 people or so. The problem is that, you know, it was subject to the weather, number one. So if it was cold outside, it was cold and baby bear and hot. Uh, there was bugs, of course. And then uh, the probably the biggest problem was that the one end was completely open. So there's a lot of light shining in. And when you try to do a presentation and put things up on the screen, it was really hard to see. So the classroom solved a lot of problems for us. We have at least double the seating in the classroom. It's air conditioned, it's heated, and it's bug free. And uh, those those made the classroom really, really great. So uh, that was that was a great addition to the Eagle Lake Observatory. Okay, so we're going along here, and um, then uh, we get to the. Uh, at CGO. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. I'm going to go back. And the imaging rig at CGO. Oh, the new CGO observatory. Here we go. Right. Exactly. Right. So, along about the same time that we were doing the hotspot classroom and the Sylvia classroom, down at CGO, we were building a new observatory down there as well. So uh, the old observatory was old. I mean, it was it was it was really showing its years, and so we uh, we got approval to build the new one down there. So this is the destruction of the old observatory, and and we also did some for refurbishment to the warming house as well. The warming house had windows on both sides. Uh, they were getting old and quite frankly, you know, kind of decrepit. So we took the windows out of the east side because uh, one of, that's where the headlights would show. And then we just, that hole up there that you see, we put an air conditioner in there so that we actually had an air conditioner during the summer. And then put new windows, I believe, on the, on the west side. And uh, so that's all that work on there. And then we also, of course, built the new observatory. And what we wanted to do, we had, of course, the old observatory and then a separate building that held the, uh, the DOB. And so with the new observatory, we built these double doors here so that we could store the daub in that building. And then the roof would roll back far enough that we could expose uh, the telescopes at the, uh, at the southern end, which is the right side of that, and, and another door. And so there is the final building there. Okay, And then we had a little drop down on the southern wall so that uh, if you wanted to view something to the south, uh, you could get a clear view from there. We don't really drop it down very often, though. It turns out that um, there isn't, uh, there, there are very few nights when it's really, really good seeing that you can see down at low in the horizon. So, um, so in 2019, we had the new observatory. There it is. Uh, still got the trees. Um, and um, this is, this is the shed here. So we've, the, the old Dob. Uh, Shed was was uh, sold and and uh, taken away, and inside we have a new LX two hundred, uh, sixteen inch LX two hundred that was put inside for a visual platform, and then we also had a new CGO imaging rig put in there, um, and that consisted of a twelve and a half inch plane wave uh, telescope and a hundred and thirty millimeter Takahashi. Uh, refractor, and both equipped with cameras, and uh, Doug Neverman and um, Robert Robert um, Miller, and uh, this guy over here, uh, Mark Job, uh, spent a great deal of time, and Dave Venny too was an instrument on in that. Uh, spent a lot of time, uh, not only getting those and installing them, but tweaking them too, and and, and getting getting the procedures put together so that the whole idea behind this imaging rig is so anybody could get a little bit of training on it and then come down with a flash drive, take some images, put them on the flash drive, and then take them. And so it's just kind of, a, they've worked on step-by-step -step procedures to do that. If I could pull a room for a second, how many imagers do we have with us? Okay, I won't ask you how much you spent on your rig. A lot. Dave, we don't say those words out loud. <laughs> but 
the fact that a club would have this kind of equipment available for you to do imaging and it's included in the membership. That's a powerful addition to the club right there. So to have that sort of equipment at home and to have it in every one of our members' households would be an incredible amount of money and I think a waste. Here is the cooperative effort of a club where we can have really nice tools like this and they're ready to go, Dave? Yep, absolutely. And, and CGO, while it's not our dark sky site, still has pretty decent skies down there, so. Uh, you, can, you can really do some good imaging. This is CGO today. Notice the lack of trees. The farmer decided he wanted more land to plow. And so he took all the trees down. They were on his property, not ours. And so um, now we started getting headlights from cars coming south on Goodhue County 1, shining onto the field. And so we had to do something about that. And so we built a new light fence uh, on the north end. And you can also see on the left side of that picture, the light fence we have on the west side uh, to block light from the neighbor's house. And, and so uh, that's, that's the only challenge with CGO is the headlights because those roads seem to be getting more popular and we do see more traffic. And of course, there's, and during, during the uh, harvest time, you have the trucks, uh, the green trucks and things that are going by. So, uh, but other than that, it's not so bad. Well, there's the canine problem. Have we solved that? Well, the, <laughs> no, no, we're getting we're so, we're, we're getting shakes. So, so the canine problem is about a half a mile from CGO. There are a couple of of uh, of retrievers. There's a canis major and canis minor. Yeah, right, right. right. There's a black lab, a, a, a chocolate lab, and a black lab, and and they would come down and visit us. But you know they they do it at night. You couldn't see these dogs, right? And, and they're quiet. They just they did. all of a sudden, literally, you'd be standing there and you'd feel this thing on your hand. Is what is this? <laughs> and it's it's the dog sniffing, you know, and wanting to get petted. You know, they were nice dogs and all that, but we were a little concerned because especially the imagers down there had all these cables hanging around and waiting for the dog to catch a cable and get his collar and go running off. And God knows what would happen to the gear. But uh, I haven't. It hasn't been as bad lately. I'm, I'm going to speak to the CGO uh, coordinator. Well, the neighbor's dog, that, that dog's old. It comes over every so often, but it's... But just so does Mark, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we still have Maya next door, and she's a very beautiful husky, but she's old. She comes over, says hi when we first show up, and then goes home. The Black Lab pair... I think there's only one now that comes down. Oh. Is it still the two? Well, he comes over. I kind of walk him halfway down and tell him to go home, and he goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. We try. Right. Yeah. Trina, I thought you were a cat lady. Apparently, the dogs listen as well. That's nice. <laughs> okay. So... Getting back to the timeline here. So with the LX200 we got in mid-2017. And then in 2018, we had this thing called Alcon. Okay. And I was, <clears throat> I was present at the time uh, when we first got started on this, back down here. Okay. When the, when the idea first surfaced, I was president. Okay. And, and um, uh, our good friend uh, and... Um, um, The traveling astronomer. Yeah, the traveling astronomer. Brandon, Brandon Hamill. Brandon, that's what I'm trying. Brandon Hamill. Brandon Hamill. Is he on? Good. <laughs> Maybe Brandon should tell the story of how how he talked me into doing Alcon. Uh, hi, Dave. Is I am I am online. You know, and I guess I got to tell you, uh, I'm surprised you didn't curse my name. I was kind of expecting. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't here before we started, Brandon. You weren't, not, you weren't on the area. Um, well, I, I had been to several Alcons and I just said to myself, my gosh, we have the premier astronomy club in the country. We need to showcase this. And uh, they were very eager. They kind of pounced on me when I went to several Alcons because they said, you know, we haven't haven't done something in Minnesota in a long time. Maybe you could uh, ask the leadership if they'd want to entertain it. And, and so we did. And uh, we really got rolling on that. And, and I got to tell you, I, I really give a lot of credit. We had an unbelievable committee that pulled it off, Dave, and I'm, I'm sure you'll speak to that. I will. Carol's in the room here, Carol, Carol George. So yeah, you know, it, 
<clears throat> anyway, um, I want to, I want to talk about Alcon because this was uh, a, a a really great effort by us, and we put on what I consider to be one of the best Alcons ever. Because I've been to a few Alcons too, and yes, we don't have the really cool dark skies that Southwestern United States has, but beyond that, I think that we put on a very entertaining as well as a a, a great a great Alcon, and it was due to a lot of volunteers. I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but uh, we had it at the Hilton here by the airport. Uh, we had some unusual things. We had this this classic telescope room. A lot of a lot of members collected these telescopes, and we had this room with with these great telescopes and stuff in it. And it was just this was a very popular exhibit that we had uh, at at Alcon. Okay, uh, of course we had we had the room. We had some great speakers, uh, Dr. Pamela Gay. Uh, we had Phil Plate came and, and spoke. We had uh, Bob King as as well as um, sorry. Berman, yeah, Bob Berman came and spoke. And Pamela, I mentioned him already. And then we also, of course, had the university professors who are just great speakers as well and have some really interesting things to say. So we, we had all that. You now we had this panel that we did talk about uh, astronomy and um, education. What, what, what was the, you were on this panel, Ron. I was on the guy on the right, taking yeah. the mic, giving the microphone to Astro Bob because he is much more insightful. Um, talking really a bit about the diversity of the club and it's been a challenge always been a challenge you read any reflector and there's some mention of a bunch of old people and a bunch of old men and really a bunch of old white men and uh <laughs> our clubs are filled with them and yet there are other clubs and so this isn't a particular problem this isn't a unique problem uh if you you know model railroads RC planes, ham radios. You see a recurrence of this same demographic, shall we say. And, you know, part of that is just because, you know, a lot of them are retired and they have the means and they have the time. And so they look for things to do. But there is part of this club that's challenged to come up with a bigger tent, a tent to include more of everybody. And what can we do? And there's always a great, yeah, and a lot of nodding and going, yeah, we should do something like that. Well, if you come up with ideas, you know, let me check the box. Yeah, it's still empty. Okay. Well, let us know. <laughs> and so that's what the board was there for, to talk a little bit about the diversity of clubs and how we can improve that and what the benefit of that is and how we can look to uh, make the tent a little bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also had the ELO outing and then people went out to the ELO and uh, then we had a barbecue out there. It was great. Caters, caters, barbecue. Hey, aren't we having a barbecue this weekend? Yeah, we are. We are. Well, if you're there online, well, make sure you By the way, if, if you're out there, the food was great and the same caterers coming out this weekend. So, yeah. And we had a live band. Live band out there. And uh, then we had, of course, the, the banquet where there were a bunch of awards. And we had our volunteers and our valued volunteers. I had a great... Well, as actually Baltz and I, we were co-chairpersons, uh, and we had a great group of people working with us. Everybody had their their jobs, and they did that. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm, I'm wearing something tonight, and you, you people online can't see this right now, but but, but we could, right? But we could. What? Ah, okay. So what I have is the ingenious idea that uh, John Popoli came up with for having you know, everything you need in one little program that hung around your neck. And the thing had, if you, if you were going on, on uh, uh, trips, on, on- Gotta get to the mic, Dave. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yep. wandered away. Okay. Okay. Hold it. Okay. So if you were going on field trips, it had, it had your little logo on there for the field trips, it had it for the, for the star barbecue, it had it for the, for the banquet, because those were all extra, and you had to pay for those. And we got that recorded. So if you paid for it, it was on. It was on your little booklet as your as, as your ticket. It had your name on it, and then really cool thing here. You know, it hangs like this. So when you want to look at it, you bring it up, and it was printed upside down. So that when you looked at it, it was right side up. This is so genius, proud of genius. that. Okay, that's John Popley. It's John Popley. I'm telling yeah. you, and and uh, and Trina helped too. And and uh, you know, it's it's things like that that made I think that made this Alcon that we did. Just really special and really great. And I don't know, maybe maybe Carol's going to talk about it too. I don't know, but yeah, so. And those volunteers right there, Jerry, Heather, just 
they're behind the scenes and yet they're also the point of the spear and or events like that can't happen without those people right in fact nothing in this club happens without people like that all right so she is she is so so heather is saying that the the guy the, the other guy in here is jamie from utah because in 2017 uh, the Utah Astronomical Society hosted the Alcon that was at Casper, Wyoming, and they and and Heather volunteered with them out there, and then he came and volunteered with us here. So now they did have a total solar eclipse, and they did have a solar solar eclipse. show off. <laughs> I know. I ordered one up, but it it was you know the supply Didn't chain show. issue. So. <laughs> um. So then in uh, in, in 2019. Um, we started uh, having talks with um, a an area that John Popley was actually working with, but it's a UNIVM uh, area called Cedar Creek Ecosystem Ecosystem Science Reserve up in Bethel, and um, we started having talks with them because while we have a place to observe in the East Metro, and we have you know South down at Cherry Grove, and we have West Eagle Lake. The north one, we don't really have a north. We have Long Lake, but that's like two and a half hours north, nothing close to the cities. And so this is up in Bethel, which is uh, fairly close, you know, for, considering. And so we started talks with them. And uh, we've been cultivating that relationship. It kind of went on hold during uh, during COVID, but we've picked it back up again. And in fact, uh, we are having a star party there tomorrow night. And I, I we're, we expect that it's, some point in the near future that will become another observing site for us to use all the time so uh just thought i'd say that uh so here it is it's up just off uh highway 65 oops north of the cities and um uh, and, and and just to the east and it you know it's not super dark but it's not bad it's not bad and so i mean you can almost see the milky way there right yeah i think so yeah yeah, when it's yeah. not cloudy. So it's uh, and 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 the people up there are great. I mean, and, and uh, we really enjoyed. They they welcomed us. The 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 uh, uh, Caitlin, who is the director up there, just loves us. And they have a little classroom up there that we were able to do presentations in. And then there's an area behind the classroom where that we go. That's kind of a field there that that we're able to set up uh, our, our scopes. So Dave, got a quick fun fact for you. Okay. So Cedar. Yeah, Cedar Creek first contacted us because they had been offered the Larson telescope. <laughs> and, and so Caitlin was asking if, uh, if we could get something going up there and they could get this telescope, which would then sit in a room somewhere while they raised money to build an observatory. Where have we heard that before, John? <laughs> So you told them to run away and, uh, from the telescope, right? Yes, yes. And we, yeah, we said when, when the telescope went to power, uh, we also told them that she dodged a bullet. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, we, we do have a telescope that we're going to be um, uh, donating uh, for their use, um, and we're working on that right now. So. Now we get telescopes donated to us all the time, and every so often we get, you know, a decent telescope that's worth using. So, all right, and now we're up to the 2020s, and of course, the first thing that happened in 2020 was COVID hit, right? And um, uh, of course, pretty much shut us down for a period of time, and then, um, you know, being that we're most of our activities are outdoors. Uh, we were able to start slowly opening up and we had things called uh, impromptu star parties where we had people tell us they were going so that, you know, if something happened and somebody caught COVID at one of those star parties, at least we could trace, you know, do some tracing with them. To my knowledge, we have never had any kind of COVID report from one of our star parties. Not from an ISB. I don't, have we had it from a well we had we had one at this this past summer from nnsf there was one from camping with the stars this oh, year yeah. so it was this year after the so-called pandemic was supposed to be over yeah right and to be clear it was someone called us and said oh by the way i tested positive yeah, i was at correct. the star party right, right. yep so it was very proactive to let us know 
Yep. Yeah. So we yeah. could alert everybody that was there so they could take so, proper I, I think all in all, we handled it really, really quick. Yes, for the lawyers online, we were not a spreader event. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then um, we did some upgrades to the owner and observatory out at Eagle Lake Observatory. Okay, so at that, uh, that observatory built in, in uh, late 90s, so we're talking, you know, 20 years old, was showing some signs of, of wear and tear. And so we had the we had the, the rollers replaced on that uh, so that we could we could roll it a little bit easier. We had uh, steps that were that were made. We had a new railing system that was put in um, and included some features like constellation panels. Okay, yeah. And so those are around uh, the Sylvia Casby. Let's pull the room. How many of you welded and or painted some of those panels? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a few people. There's, there's a few. There's a few. Um, and then, uh, and then one of the, one of the biggest things was this motorized roof. So uh, uh, thank you to Doug and Merle for uh, putting together this uh, motorization effort, so that now the roof no longer needs two two able body people to push it open. It'll now open by itself with the with the motor. And uh, so this is a huge. Uh, it's a big roof. Pretty heavy, so this is this is really a, a big improvement. And then uh, we also replaced the uh, Mead LX two two hundred sixteen inch LX two hundred. We um, um, we're having some problems with the old one, and so uh, we got a generous donation to replace that. And so we have, and so we have a new one out there now. And is the old one sitting in a garage somewhere, waiting for someone to build an observatory for it? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Cedar Creek, who said that? Hush your mouth. <laughs> Okay. All right. And uh, then in 2022, we got word that our very own Father Brown won the 2022 North Central Regional Astronomical League Regional Newsletter Editor Award. Uh, Let's hear it for him, everybody. Yeah. 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 This is a. Uh, well deserved award, I might add. Absolutely. He does a great job with with the Gemini every every two months, and uh, we're we're really fortunate to have such a dedicated person who does such a great job. And uh, Ron, that, that's that's what I've got. So that's a great point to exit. Well, to at least exit the presentation on the people that make this club. Now everybody says, "Oh, it's a group effort." You're right, and that group is made of individuals and without that individual effort there is no group effort people have got to step up i can do that i'll take care of that i'll bring the donuts or sorry cupcakes yeah <laughs> people that step up and agree to do something is what this club is all about i tried to come up with what well, i thought you know there was a a trend online a little while ago where they were coming up with like the Mount Rushmore of whatever organization, the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks, the Mount Rushmore of uh, first baseman. I don't know. But as we were talking about putting this together, we talked about the Mount Rushmore of MAS. Well, you'll know that Mount Rushmore has only got four people on it. We need a lot more than four people. We're in mountains Rushmore. To include all the people that put, put together a standout effort in pursuit of this club, in contribution to this club, in benefit to this club. Now, you'll remember, uh, maybe it's just me, but really good ensemble movies like The Seven Samurai, Ocean's Eleven, Lord of the Rings, each person has a different role. And they fill that role to the best of their ability, and it makes the group better. And you need to have a ranger. You need to have a wizard. You need to have a warrior, right? You Come on, you D&D guys, start nodding for me. We won't out you here. It's a safe space. So you have those people that have speciality. And that's what makes the club so rich. We have people like administrators and leadership, people that know how to lead groups, people like Mike Kibbett, Clayton Lindsay, they have those skills. They can have meetings and they take what they know from the business world and they apply that to the club. This 
redo of the Constitution, as nail-biting and exciting as that is, it absolutely has to be done. I'm a, I'm a part of a lot of other organizations, nonprofit, volunteer kind of things, and you have to have law on your side because someone comes along, an opportunist, and they'll just take you to the cleaners, and there's nothing you can do but hand out the check. So to have people take care of that for us is, I don't want to say priceless because you can pay lawyers a lot, but it's really expensive. And for those people to step up and take care of that, that's a great service to the club. There are organizers, not necessarily in leadership, but hey, I'm going to be out doing some imaging if anyone wants to come join me. If you don't know how to work this thing, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to work it. All right. Or we're going to have an impromptu star party, or maybe we'll have a star party in the park. Yeah. And it's just one person steps up and says, you know what we ought to have? We ought to have something in the park. That's a great idea. Let's do that. And yet one person has got to champion that because we can all sit and nod about it. Yeah, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. But someone's got to grab onto it. And you've seen projects happen, maybe at work, maybe at school, maybe at home. It doesn't get done unless someone grabs onto it and doesn't let go. That's inspiring. And then other people come along. Yeah, I can help with that. I can do my part. I can do a little bit. Builders are another category. Another face on our Mount Rushmore would be the builders, the Dave Olmsteads, the Merles, right? The Bill Glasses, he was a builder. Those people that put hammer to nail and drill to wood and, and drill to those metal arches. <laughs> you have that skill of building. Yeah, I've got a truck. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a cement mixer. I can bring that out. I've got a welder. I'll come out and help weld the railings. And maybe you don't know astronomy that well. Maybe like Dave, Dave got interested in building. So he heard about the Onan project and said, yeah, I want to do that. That looks like a lot of fun. Observers. We've got some top-notch, world-class observers in our organization. Dave Toftison, for example. I mean, national publications, national merits, national recognition. Yeah, he's ours. Now, I don't want to be like the local news channels. If any athlete does really well, they find out when they were in Minnesota and say, Minnesota's own Greg LeMond. <laughs> Minnesota's own Lindsey Vaughn. It's like, she doesn't live here. Yeah, I know, but she did. So... I don't want to do that with Dave, but it's just another example of the people we have available. And not just the people that do this and are famous and good at it, but the people that share, that write in the Gemini, that come up and present and talk about what they do. And you can even approach them and learn from them. It's incredible. We have the researchers like Russ Durkee and Jim Fox. Jim used to bring up uh, occultation videos. Boy, there's some compelling stuff. Hang on. It's still there. It's still there. Hold on. And it's gone. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Scientifically, there's some great knowledge we can get from there. Especially, Suresh, did you do part of the uh, that distant occultation of uh, one of the moons? Of... No. Was it Titan? Okay, I'm thinking of something else that was way out there. And there was like a strip of people that showed up from like Texas up to Oklahoma and everyone had time, time clocks and they were slotting that and they were, that you could actually trace out the shape of this thing by what time it disappeared and showed up for people. Fantastic. People that pitch in like citizen science, you get any astronomer in here and they will talk in glowing terms about citizen science and the stuff that regular citizens are able to do to help out and help share the load. Outreachers, Park Uncle, Pied Piper of Minneapolis Astronomy. I got to talk with Doug Brown. I haven't talked with Doug in a long time. And the heart that man had for sidewalk astronomy was infectious to me. And he, Brown, I only did that for a couple of years. Fair enough. I got hooked by it. I was excited by it. John Dobson, where are all the people? Downtown Minneapolis or downtown St. Paul? What's that park in Minneapolis they're at? <laughs> Pershing? Pershing Park. Go to where the people are. Get them a view through a scope. You all know what happens next. People start weeping. 
when they see Saturn, Jupiter, even the moon blows people's minds. We can make that happen. Outreach tends to be kind of a half and half in a club. There are people that just want to observe for themselves, and there are people that want to help observe for others. But really, it's all kind of outreach. Because even when you're observing for yourself, there are people watching you do that, and that gets them interested. Especially when you share that in Gemini or the discussion forums. People see that. They get inspired. How many of you are new to imaging? You've been imaging with digital, but you didn't do film. You don't know what a hyper hybrid film is. <laughs> you never soaked 35 millimeter film in liquid nitrogen? No. It's a treat. So imaging's old, and yet some of you are new to it. And I see it every day in the discussion forums. Hey, is anyone going out there? I'm not really confident in how to do this. It'd be great to have someone there to ask questions. I'm not paying anyone for that. People show up. And it's such a great credit to you. There's an inherent generosity in that participation. And it's just amazing. And finally, travelers. People whom we live vicariously through. Mark and Mark and Mark and the other two Marks. Yeah, we were observing our weekend. Where were you? Chile. We were up on the Alta Plano in Chile. Dark sky there? <laughs> yeah, dark sky. Uh, where else? Africa? South, well, South America. I know I've heard a couple of stories of that. Okie Tex. Okie Well, that's in the United States, Dave. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is traveling. Yes, it is. I was thinking of the stuff the guys get on airplanes have done. Oh. Bill Glass. Have an eclipse? He's been there. No, I'm not kidding, folks. In 2008, Check my numbers. 2008, there was an eclipse in China. We wanted to go. It was in Shanghai. 2009, thank you. Bill Glass was with Fred Espinac and his crew. They're sitting on the ground in China. Said, well, the whole country is going to see rain tomorrow. We're not going to see this. But there's a plane on the ramp. And if you guys want to write a check, we're going to take that to India in about four hours. And that's going to put us there at sunrise. And we're going to watch the eclipse from there. And they all said, I, <laughs> every single one of them grabbed their checkbook and went. If not for those people, we wouldn't get to see things like that. Uh, I remember tuning in to the China eclipse. And every webinar or every webcast that had it live, raindrops on the camera, plastic on the telescopes. No one saw anything in all of China. That thing's big enough to cover 11 time zones. And they had to go all the way to India to see it. So those are just a couple of the faces on the Mount Rushmore of our club. I was presenting a couple months back on the coder we have up at Eisenhower. And I talked with someone, I think it was the day after, I think it was a couple days later. And they mentioned, wow, that was really interesting about that vapor coder. To coat mirrors, put the coating on it. I don't know anything about that stuff. And I said, well, that's why you, you're part of a club. That's why you join a club, because there are people that know about that and can talk about it and help you learn about it. And that's why an organization gets together. You're just one thread, right? If we all had the same thread, we'd make a blanket. How interesting is that? But instead, that thread that you add to the organization produces a rich tapestry that makes a wonderful image, a rich, a rich, intriguing, inspiring image. And that's what being part of a club is. That's all you know. We need that thread added to the image. And that's what's been so exciting about a club like this. Because the club is 50 years old. But that is a collection of people. And it's the people that make the club, the people that continue the club, the people that make the club a rich and enriching experience and a great environment in which to learn, in which to do astronomy, to learn astronomy, and to love it. You find people with you, other travelers that enjoy it as well. 
And that's something that not a lot of people find out there. And so that's a great credit to the people that have been involved in this club, the people that have stepped up and said, yeah, I can do that. Add my thread to the tapestry. And it's made a rich organization over these last 50 years. The one thing I want to leave you with is I expected the last slide to maybe say, what's next? What do we got planned next? But I think more important is to ask who's next. Because our club is a who, not a what. So 50 years from now, who's going to be taking care of Onan? Put your hand on, Mark. <laughs> We're going to need other people. So make sure to spread the word. Get out there and tell people. Tell them. Remind them. If you're going to have barbecue on Saturday, it's time to register. Contractually, I had to repeat that three times. So we're done, okay? But spread the word of the MAS. We're going to continue to provide excellent programming, online resources, ways for you to get connected. And if I could, and we didn't note this, we noted COVID, but we didn't remind people of all the effort that went into bringing all that we do online. No, don't be, don't be surprised. It's not a lot. So Matt, Vaults, the other people that have taken the next step in the club and gone from in-person to virtual to continue not only to offer something throughout COVID, but now continuing into the future. I don't know. I'm, I'm on the other side of the metro. It takes 45 minutes to get here. So I'm not always available on the first Thursday of the month. And for me to be able to go online and see that presentation and to hear the discussions and to see what the club members are up to, that's been invaluable. That's, that's made me an active member, even if I'm not here. And that's been really exciting. So be a thread. That's exactly what we expect of you. You don't have to be the best at this and that and that and that. Just do what you love, bring it to the club, and we'll continue to grow and be an organization that people are excited to be part of. Thank you a lot for your time tonight. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mark for putting uh, this together, uh, Ahmed and, uh, and Steve, there he is. And so we look forward to more celebration tomorrow night at a star party at Baylor and then Saturday night. Thanks for your attention. So we're gonna have an intermission now brief and we're going to have carol come up and we're going to put his his uh his presentation on my computer and but i'm going to fill a little bit you know ron was talking about threads what an old timer me as an imager i think of that as a pixel let's keep adding pixels to the tapestry you know so you know you know I, and i didn't have a section tonight about uh about new members you know and i do that every every month but you know, new members, you know, there's, there's parts of us, parts, parts of us, parts of this club, parts of the organization, we're aging. We need some help from some of you newer and younger members to step up, fill some slots. And, you know, at the, at the, at the beginning part of the meeting, I had a little slot in there where you can start filling in. Board member at large, secretary, president. You don't need a whole lot of experience to be president of this club. So, and I speak from experience or lack of, and you can see how I run meetings. You can understand, you know, anybody can do this. Should we run it from the flash drive? Or should we... I'll run it from the flash drive. It'll run fine. It's a Lenovo. Watch it crash. So our featured presentation tonight is Carol. Oh yeah, yeah, you gotta share. You gotta stop sharing and then you gotta reshare. Share, share. Go down here. So Carol's gonna is from is the president. So Carol is the president of the Astronomical League. And he, when I asked, I sent him an invitation to have him come spend tonight and this weekend essentially with us to celebrate our 50th anniversary, I didn't even have to coax him. 
All I had to do is ask, and here he is. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Carol, Astronomical League president. It's your show. Um, oh, you got to have notes. Yeah, I, that's a good idea. And uh, we'll get this, the last part of this up. And, you know, for those of you at home, I just want you to know what you're missing out on. And I realize that, you know, we have, we're, at, we're gonna have cupcakes. So, and then also like Ron was talking about um, the fact that he enjoys the virtual login to do or connect with the meeting or watch it later. Um, what I haven't told everybody yet is, I'm not going to be here next month, but I'll dial in. I'm, I'm uh, going to take my wife to uh, northern Wisconsin, and we're going to hang out for a while up there until the um, Aurora Summit starts on Friday night. So I'm going up there. I'm going to hang out with her, and then I'm going to go to the Aurora Summit for two and a half days and uh, leave her alone in the Airbnb. She'll be okay with that. So you know, the show is yours. I thought Mark was going to run for five more years as president of the club. I didn't guess. We can only run. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for such a gracious invitation to come. And I so enjoyed the history of the club. I can't believe how much energy, well, I should be able to believe that. I've, I've followed you for several years. I can't believe all the energy there is in this club. You set out the vision, your leadership sets out the vision, and then you accomplish whatever you decide you're going to do. When the uh, club ran an article in the Reflector, the magazine of the Astronomical League, about, uh, I forget how many years ago, you gave the story of all of your observatories, and I can't remember how many responses we got from that from readers who said, can't believe we can barely get one observatory going, and yet that club at that point had four, I think it was. And so you have really been noticed across the astronomical uh, uh, league and across the world. But it's really inspiring. Uh, you have become the premier a voice of astronomy in this part of the country. And when we started talking about Alcon, when Brandon uh, was at several conventions and we sat down together and says, Brandon, what do you think? I know you could pull it off, couldn't you? He says, of course, and I'm gonna take it back to the board and we're gonna talk about it. And the last thing I knew, here we were, uh, we were at Alcon. I have fond memories when we came up about a year before the convention, uh, we were took out, taken out to the uh, observatory I don't know whether it was uh, late October or November. And in Kansas City, we're not used to snow quite that early. But <laughs> I was showing Eagle Observatory and the snow, and I thought, that's pretty cool. We don't have it quite that often. So, okay, anyway, let's go ahead and get our program started. Okay. Are you good? All right, wonderful. As I'm doing the research for the talk, I uh, uh, noticed that uh, Minnesota has one of the IDA dark sky preserves. I wasn't aware of that until I started the process. And how many of you have been to this uh, uh, Voyagers National Park? A few of you have been there? And I haven't been there, but sounds like it's a great, uh, it's a water, it's a light basically, isn't it? Uh, three lakes, yeah, that's pretty cool. Very few places in the country have that designation. And so we're very pleased that Minnesota has that as well. And of course, as we've already alluded to, Alcon 2018, that was the premier, uh, one of the premier uh, Alcons we have had in the last 50 years. I've been talking to Jim Fox for probably 10 years 
about an, a, a convention in Minnesota. He said, well, we'll get around to it one of these days. And so it was well worth the, uh, worth the wait because that was one of the most outstanding conventions I've ever been to. Attendance was up right there at the height of any we've ever had. Had a few Canadians come across the border and come down to join us. So it was a wonderful experience. And of course, this guy was very important to the whole part there as was the whole team. Had lots of excellent presentations. We've already talked about the uh, uh, various speakers that were th who were there, and we're very pleased with what happened there. Uh, and you really set the bar high for future outcomes. And we always like to give an award at each year's convention on people who have really stepped up and gone well beyond what is normally expected. And Dave was one of those, and also Voss was the other one. And it was just such a thrill to see the leadership take such an active role, said, we've been nominated to do this convention, we're going to do it. And they did it to the very highest degree uh, it, it could have been possible. The next time I visited Eagle uh, Lake Observatory, there wasn't any snow on. We were in the middle of the convention, so that was much more pleasant. We talked to some people on the way up today, in fact, uh, and they were asking, we were talking about being from Kansas City where we don't have snow until uh, maybe just a little bit in January, February. And they said, well, we have it all the time, so we're used to it. I thought, that's wonderful. <laughs> Since the league is having its 75th anniversary, along with the 50th anniversary for this club, thought we'd talk a little bit about our own history along with that. We started the journey in actually in 1946. Actually, a little before that, there was talk of having some umbrella group. We started that discussion in about 1941. Had about 1,500 members and less than $62 in the bank. I mean, we were high rollers at that point. And of course, we had the beginnings of uh, bylaws, that wonderful discussion we all have from time to time, in which the league is going through right now. Uh, it was interesting to hear the discussion about the attorneys earlier in the program. Uh, we have that same thing going on right now. We've got a retired attorney who is being very careful to make every a possible thing that could ever happen on the planet, uh, big included in the bylaws. And it, <laughs> it is frustrating and nerve wracking and takes forever, but it's worth it as we alluded to already. You have to have that uh, guideline to go by. The first time we uh, started out with our uh, precursor to the reflector, it was called the Astronomical League Bulletin. And the goal was to take those fledging clubs and put them together as one organization. Federer was the very first president of the uh, club. Here's what the statistics were like at the very first, we had the Mideast with 17 societies and right on down North Central six and right on down. Uh, at that point in 1952, we had 68 societies and 3,665 members. We were really hot stuff back then. Now, after COVID did its thing for two years, we're now up to 304 societies. And we have a new high in membership. We have 22,000 members across the country and the world. So it's, uh, uh, I know this club has been part of that as, all, uh, as well. We have found out that during the pandemic, more people were getting out under the stars to observe because they weren't constricted by any kind of uh, COVID mandates. They could get out there. Uh, astronomical vendors were backed up uh, for months and months and months. You couldn't get your instruments. It's very frustrating, but uh, 
finally, I think that is about to uh, be taken care of right now, but it's been a real struggle and we've all learned lots of lessons. And I'll get to a few of those here in just a little bit. Then in 1958, we went from the just a few page reflector to one that looked a little more professional there. And we had had the usual things going on uh, in the reflector. And believe it or not, in that year, we had the Denver Astronomical Society. And that was the early days of TV. And they immediately pounced on their local TV station and was actually doing astronomical type uh, articles and programs on TV. That was unheard of. The new medium TV was barely alive, and yet we had an astronomy club that was featured on it. And then as we went further along in 2021, we actually went up to 32 pages in the publication. And as we were saying earlier, when we were uh, talking about the newsletter editor, the current newsletter editor for this club, uh, relying on member articles, that's exactly what our philosophy is at the astronomical league level as well. As well. Uh, we love getting those articles about unique ways of observing, unique ways of uh, uh, doing imaging and other parts of astronomy. And everybody likes the pretty pictures, myself included. It's just amazing what our imagers can do once they have the uh, equipment to do it with. And who would have thought 25 years ago, this was a professional's. Amateurs could not do any of this. So it's certainly opened up the doors. Go forward to 1986 and Reflector. And they were talking back then about losing the night sky. You know, that was uh, what, 34 years ago, talking about losing the night sky. And today, uh, of course, we're having those discussions as well. Uh, you, know, you can do all the filtering you want to, and it helps a lot, but still uh, dark skies are something to be treasured. There was Percival Lowell, a quote from him back in August of 1916, said only, not only is civilized man actively engaged in defacing such part of the Earth's surface as he comes in contact with, he is equally busy blotting out the sky. That was back in 1916. <laughs> he was ahead of his time, was he? For, for that generation, it was also there. But really what we have to do, we have to reinvent ourselves as we go along. Uh, it may be a different experience when we're dealing with the public, but we have to go with the tools we have and even with all the light pollution, all this, we can still show our new members Saturn with its exotic rings. We can still get that, those wows that we all got when we first looked through that eyepiece. Back in 1973, uh, Tim Hunter was one of the co-founders of the International, uh, the IDA, International Dark Sky Association. And February 73, they started that venture, and there's several chapters across the country in individual states now. It's been a real uh, boon to that situation. And the Dark Sky Parks is one example of that effort. One of the things that we started out with in uh, 1993, and just actually a little before, was recognizing our youth our National Outstanding Young Astronomers. That's where it started. And we were talking earlier about diversity. And when we talk about diversity, it's not only about the young people, it's about people who look like the rest of our country and our communities. We had a panel, uh, I led a panel at Alcom this year about diversity. And we're not done with the topic. I know we talk about diversity all the time. But the league is committed to somehow uh, helping the underserved, the kids in inner cities who don't have access to a telescope, but maybe we can provide some 
uh, telescope time that they can at least observe from a robotic telescope or something like that. We're going to start looking at uh, doing alliance with individual libraries, maybe to uh, have a, a afternoon or late afternoon uh, session at the library and tap into a telescope on another part of the world. So these kids can at least say, see some images that they will never have the opportunity to see as inner city residents. Just one example. Another uh, program we've had for many years is the Horkheimer series of programs. Uh, how many of you remember Jack Horkheimer? Probably everybody in the room remembers Jack. <laughs> uh, after he passed, Dwight Horkheimer, the nephew, stepped forward and says, I want to keep this program in place. And it's expanded into youth imaging and in addition to the service awards. And we have several of those each year at our Alcon meetings. So it's in good shape. Here's an example of what some of our youth are doing right now. It's amazing. We have uh, one group, uh, uh, two brothers who have basically traveled the world with their parents. And the thing they do on their vacations is check out the dark sky areas in that country. And they go on and photograph, uh, do imaging of that particular area. It's just incredible what these kids can do. Uh, we're, we are constantly amazed at uh, if given the opportunity. Uh, some of them come out, out of astronomy class in high school, but that is, uh, it's not always the coolest thing to do is to be an astronomer in a high school. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, sports, and there's not a thing wrong with sports, but let's just say they have to fight for, for time sometimes. But uh, uh, we're very proud of the ones that persevere and go with it. I'm preaching the choir right now, but observing is what it's all about. But as we alluded to a little while back, not everybody will be the best observer and know every single star <laughs> in the skies. Every club has at least one or two that you look at. That, oh, yeah, that's such and such. Uh, so you take the skills that come to this team and get the best out of everybody. And this club has been extremely good at doing that over the years through the various leaderships. In 1967, the uh, uh, Messier Club, we uh, came up with the first uh, winner of the Messier Award. It was presented to Catherine Delaney of the Amateur Astronomer Association of Pittsburgh. And that was just the beginning of uh, uh, thousands of uh, Messier uh, Awards since that time. Another thing that was uh, a little unique. There was a, um, uh, back in those days, they even had license plates that you could get for your car that, uh, for the front plate or whatever that advertised you an astronomer. So that was sort of forward reaching for its day. And now when you get your reflector, in each issue, you'll see a list of all the awards, including the Mazier. Uh, just this year, we added a couple of more awards to the stable, and we're now up to over 80 awards. And one of the awards this year was to fill a gap in the Messier program, particularly for those who want to become master observers and uh, be recognized for that achievement. We found out that for Southern hemisphere people who are trying to get the Master Observer Award, they, the Messier uh, list did not fit for South America in the Southern Hemisphere. So we've got an alter alternative for those people, and you'll see more about that in this month's Reflector, the one coming up. After 75 years, one of our secrets is we all want to experience the wonder, beauty, and mystery of the heavens. That's what it's about. Doesn't matter how long we've been around, there's something about gazing up into the heavens that really puts everything in perspective. 
I, I was at our local star party in uh, Kansas City last week. In fact, I hadn't been out for a few months uh, due to too much administrative stuff going on. And it was so neat to recapture that feeling yet once again, of what it's like to look up there and see what's going on above us. The league tries to be as accessible as possible. And sometimes when we don't, uh, when we aren't able to give recognition at a national convention, we try to travel to wherever they're going to be and present it there. One example was uh, in 2013 at Stella Fame. I had the distinct honor of uh, presenting our Webmaster Award at that event. Uh, uh, Ken was the Webmaster of the Springfield Telescope Makers. And it was so incredible looking out uh, over that group because it's almost like a cult following. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's almost like a cult following because as I was uh, taking the trip around the property there, the, uh, the president of the club told me at that point, he says, there are people who will cancel family events to come to this event. He says, just last year, he said, someone canceled or postponed a wedding because the couple had scheduled their wedding the week of cellophane. And Aaron says, we will not be at the wedding if you continue with that. <laughs> So we astronomers get a little fanatic, I guess, at times, don't we? But uh, yeah, that's, but one of the other things that really made me hopeful at this particular event was looking out over the crowd, and it's probably six, seven hundred people there, at least, maybe more. And the one thing, uh, you know, we're always talking about, it's all we old people, older people, that who are in astronomy. And yet, uh, at that convention, you looked out and there were lots of families, lots of 30s and 40 year olds and their kids with them. And so it really gave me hope that we're doing okay if we just give the proper motivation. In fact, one of the dying arts is mirror making. At that event, they had a lot of mirror grinding going on. In fact, this teenager, I think he was 19 years old, he was so proud of having uh, um, made his own mirror. It was a small one, but he was mighty proud of it, I'll tell you. Another thing we did differently in 2011 was go to Bryce Canyon to have a convention. And that was a different experience because anytime you get the federal government involved, things get a little complicated. <laughs> this was no different than that. We had to go through the park service in order to get approval. And even though uh, it was uh, hard to know what, what you were observing the first night or two, there were so many more stars out there in Bryce Canyon, uh, but it uh, really was a good situation in spite of the restrictions. For example, uh, normally at a star party, you'd be able to keep your telescopes up all night long, no big deal. But out there, if we went up to a certain point and set up privately up there, we had to take everything down at each night simply because it was a public area. And since that was our first venture into having an Alcon in a national park, of course they were going to win. So we had to go along with those restrictions, but it was wonderful. Uh, got more comments about that one as far as an observing star party or observing Alcon. These, how many have seen the hoodoos before? Several of you have. If you ever get an opportunity, uh, go out there. Yeah, those are called hoodoos. I'm not exactly sure how that developed, but that's what they're called anyway. <laughs> I have a little personal experience to tell uh, when I was in Bryce Canyon. Uh, Zion National Park is also very close to Bryce Canyon. And I had a rental car when we were out there. And usually I'm very good about checking out everything out before I go to, uh, I'll bring a, a rental car. Zion uh, National Park has a tunnel that uh, is, uh, I, I don't know, it's about a quarter of a mile long in the park. And so I realized I was going to have to go through that. And I started fiddling with my car to see if I could get my lights on. And everything I tried failed. So I put my blinkers on and I went about 
uh, a quarter of a mile with blinkers on and traffic coming the other direction. So uh, as a good astronomer, I should have checked things out a lot better when it comes to lighting, <laughs> but I didn't. This is what it was like uh, from the uh, grounds of Bryce Canyon. And we were at Ruby's Inn, which uh, is a, a fairly high elevation. And this is some of the setup that we had to take down at night because there was uh, the legal restrictions there. And that's the Motley crew, our Motley crew at the league level. Then. That was hosted by the uh, uh, by the Salt Lake National Society. Yeah. Um, each year, the uh, uh, the park Bryce Canyon hosts a uh, star party. It goes on for seven days, and so we sort of tied that in with that. This was a very rustic type uh, convention. We were well aware that we were in the middle of the West because it was that that was definitely there anybody know who that is i guess i've got it up there <laughs> carolyn shoemaker who was a member of the shoemaker lady nine uh team and when they were doing all the observing uh, david levy and gene and uh, and carolyn shoemaker uh mr shoemaker Lost his solder. He was having, he didn't, he couldn't pass a pilot's, a pilot's test. But she had great sight. She took the pilot's test. And so she flew uh, Gene around for much of his observing. He was in geology heavily. And uh, so she was very important. Uh, she did a lot of the research. She didn't get a whole lot of credit for it, but she was right there in the background doing it. And the league was fortunate to have, when she passed last year, we gave her our top award and also. Uh, Lowell Observatory within the last three months uh, gave a, a, a memorial for her. So. In 2012, we uh, went to Chicago and each uh, group brings their different situations to the table. Adler Observatory set up telescopes here. We were there around the 4th of July, so it all worked out. A little different to have telescopes at Adler Observatory, but it was it was neat. How many have been to Yerkes Observatory? Looks like half the room has. Pretty incredible. And I haven't heard the latest about uh, the status. However, the last I heard was it was being saved from demolition. And that would be such a loss if that were to happen, because it's been around so many years. Uh, in fact, during this convention in 2012, we were scheduled to uh, have a, a field trip to uh, Yerkes Observatory. And I got a call that morning from the observatory saying, it's gonna really be hot out here. And we know you've got some elderly people who may not be able to stand it. So bottom line is they brought their exhibits from Yerkes to the convention for those who didn't feel comfortable going to the observatory. So it was a very nice omen on their part to do that. This was another first for Alcon 2012. Astronomy Magazine actually performed with their blues band. <laughs> Dave Acker, he was right there in the middle of it. We were, uh, had the, the uh, at the Lincolnshire Marriott, and we were at an impromptu uh, star party there with all the <laughs> night lights, but it was a star party. Another feature of that, and like I say, every convention brings something different. We had a sailboat, the Wendy, out in the middle of the of the lake, and quite a quite a feat that night. In two thousand thirteen. We went to Atlanta, Georgia, and for the first time that I ever remember, we had it at a an actual science center. There was, uh, it was operated by the local school district. They had chickens, 
that were being raised there and all kinds of animals. It was a truly a different outcome. Just uh, one example of youth winners that we have at the uh, local convention. I stuck this one in for 2013 as some of the winners. Another thing, we're getting back to the diversity thing. Uh, Steve Ramson of the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project, he set up his solar observing that, uh, that convention and had a lot of the kids coming in to observe. And this is something, as we get back talking about inner city and kids who are, for other reasons, stuck in the middle of the city and can't get out to dark stuff. That's, this was invaluable, what was done there on a limited scale. How many of you have heard of the Library Telescope Project? A few of you have? It's been going since about 15 years ago, I guess. And one of our clubs in New Hampshire started that uh, program. And we have, uh, there's been great success across the country. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri has about 150 uh, telescopes out among their uh, libraries in the city. Uh, uh, an important thing is they're all, Fairly simple telescopes, but they've been modified to where uh, you can't mess with the eyepieces, that sort of thing, so that you can get them back. Minimal uh, uh, maintenance is required. So it's been a, a real hit. And the way it operates, uh, set up just like books, you check out a, a library telescope. And it's been very successful. In fact, there's waiting lists all through. In fact, the league, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe it's been four by now, we set up a program where in each region, each of the 10 regions, one a club could apply for one of the uh, telescopes to give to a, a library. And uh, uh, you had uh, one each, for each of the 10 regions, plus one for members at large. So that's been highly successful. Back in 2013, I was honored to present the Peltier Award uh, for uh, John Bortle, uh, that was at the AAVSO headquarters. Uh, just uh, that's the highest award we have in the Astronomical League. It's given to some uh, uh, deserving uh, person in the field of astronomy, whether professional or amateur. And this is the Texas Angle in San Antonio in 2014. This is uh, uh, the core group that was uh, in charge of that Alcon, and. Each Alcon has to have that group, and certainly the MAS had a lot more than four. I don't know what the final count was, probably 30 to 35. I don't know what the count was. Yeah, and you've got to have that core group, and that's what we continually tell people uh, that are anticipating doing that, is to have that core group. And uh, uh, in 2015, in Las Cruces, we were at the Vintage Hotel in Contra. And this was a little bit different. Because we kind of went to the other side a little bit there on this one. <laughs> Had a, uh, a Las Vegas lounge singer at that convention as well. Blame uh, Ron Kramer for that one. At the 2000, at that convention, the 2015, the GR Wright, that was awarded here as well to the two co-chairs. That one was presented to uh, uh, Ron Kramer. For DC, in 2016, we were honored to go to the uh, National Observatory Library. They have a very extensive collection of books. In fact, they are known as the biggest collector of paper copies of uh, astronomical type uh, periodicals across the world. And they've kept that, uh, that uh, reputation all the way through. And another thing we did in 2016 was go out to Goddard where the uh, James Webb telescope was being assembled. And go to our in the, in the uh, 
suits down there, the scientists. And at that point, they were already talking about the delays that were keeping it from going up. Little did we know that there were going to be a few more delays even after that. <laughs> and I thought, uh, is it ever going to happen? And yet, as we found out last Christmas, it did happen and it has been extremely successful. Yeah, there's been a few little bugs along the way, but they have so many redundant systems that we're in good shape. It's not like Hubble where we could go up and send a mission and repair it. Not to be with this one, it's a little too far. So we had to get it right the first time, and they did. Another thing we had at the uh, 2016 event was the NASA administrator was there, General uh, Bolden, um, giving his perspective about uh, astronomy and NASA, and it was very unusual. The awesome exaggerations were at that group, but no, not any better than Eagle Head Observatories Band. Another thing we did uh, in uh, a few years ago during my first 10 years president, that was uh, go to the Grand Rapids Public Museum to present several of the wars for people who could not travel to Alcon. And here was one of the youth awards that uh, who lived in the region and the family. I think this was one of the Astronomy Day Awards. And by the way, I want to digress just a second and say a little bit about Astronomy Day. COVID really got in the way of doing lots of things, including Astronomy Day. And I'm so, when I got the word from Mark that we were going to have Astronomy Day on Saturday, I was so thrilled because we haven't been getting nearly enough entries lately. So not trying to twist any arms or anything like that, but we would be very delighted if you would see your way to apply for Astronomy Day uh, certificate this year. So keep that in mind. Uh, Gary Tomlinson is our Astronomy Day coordinator. That's Gary right there. Uh, and um, we are in the process of revamping that program right now to uh, breathe some new energy into it. As you well know, of course, it works out better here, uh, being a little further north to do it in the fall, which we really like that. Uh, the one in the spring is not doing so well, so we're working on that angle. Here was the, one of the planetary uh, directors here that was helping out. And for a uh, mini regional convention, we had a pretty good turnout for that. Just good to see everybody that uh, was able to uh, attend and uh, come to some place that was a little closer than an Alcon. So what is the uh, Astronomical League doing post COVID? Well, in 2020, we were scheduled to be in uh, Albuquerque. They had been planning for about two or three years and everything was really falling into place. And then Cove uh, reared its ugly head. And so we said, well, we must postpone it for the first time ever an outcome being postponed since the war years. So we let 2020 slide and then we thought well okay uh, how about 2021 we'll just reschedule it and albuquerque said yeah we'll we'll do it again the next year 2021 came and it wasn't too much better so we thought we can't have two years in a row that we have not had a convention because we it could get to be a, an easy habit if we do this so what we did we put our uh smart people together and came up with a way to uh, uh, simulcast our Alcon, and that's what we did. We had our youth award winners on there. We uh, did some magic and got our Peltier award winner to be online at the same time, so we were able to do that. And also, uh, Dr. Burnell, who is the discoverer of pulsars, uh, we were able to get her online from the University of Oxford. She has an interesting story about how 
she labored in the background. She had the discovery, getting back to the diversity thing. Uh, for years and years and years, she was doing the research, had made the discoveries and had them verified, but she could get no credit or publicity at all. So she told her story at Alcon 2021 virtual. It is a very inspiring story. And we've gotten so many uh, positives from that uh, firsthand story of what it's like uh, not to be under the umbrella we talked about earlier tonight. And if we had the magic bullet on what to do to do that, we'd all be millionaires, but we're working on it. But Alcon 2021 virtual, uh, we had a talk titled Back to the Future from uh, Goddard uh, about lunar exploration. And excuse that, uh, not a real good picture there, but we, the sketching award, we were able to hook that up as well and do that online. Also, we uh, uh, had several door prize contributed by individual clubs. That was very helpful. We also had the Canadian uh, astronomer and photographer, Alan Dwyer. Dyer, he was on there uh, talking about good place to go for Aurora. How many in the room have seen an Aurora? In this state, I think it's pretty high. I just hate to hear that. <laughs> in Kansas City, we don't see those. Although in 1991, one night, uh, we were able to see it in, at my house from Midtown, Kansas City. At that particular moment, uh, it was a very good event. They saw had sightings in Florida, but that's our only time we've been able to see it in Kansas City. So I really envy you to certain extent, but I just wish I could see a few more of them. And I'm also proud to uh, know that you're doing the International Observer of the Month uh, night as well. That's a tremendous, uh, really important thing to get the public out and getting them uh, vest, vested in astronomy a little bit. One of the things we've been doing one Friday night a month, I'll back up just a little bit and say that for about the last two years, we've been a part of Explorer Alliance's uh, uh, Global Star Party, which usually happens on a Tuesday night, every Tuesday night. Uh, it's a broadcast worldwide on Zoom and the other social media. Also, uh, one Friday night per month is what we call AL Live. And we have a guest that we share with the, the audience on that as well as another Zoom presentation. So I encourage you on the 28th of October, tune in to just go on uh, YouTube and look for Astronomical League. And we start at 6 p.m. Central Time. It lasts about two hours at most. We have a speaker, and I think you'll find it interesting. Also, we have some door prize we give away as well. One of the things at this last convention we did was do a little experimenting with simulcasting. And how many of you know Dr. Barbara Harris? Few of you may have seen her at a convention at some point or another. Anyway, she's a uh, she worked with the late Don Parker, well-known uh, Mars uh, fanatic, I would say, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, imager. Uh, so we awarded her the uh, Peltier Award for 2022. In addition, this year, actually last year in 2021, we uh, added a new award an imaging award, and this is strictly for women. And we've had a tremendous outpouring of support and entries for this award. It's called the Fleming Imaging Award. And we having that uh, for the time being, it's being sponsored by Explore Alliance. And so if there's any women imagers among the club, feel free to send them forward.
we finally had the Alcon that was supposed to be in 2020 and 2022. And here was the chair, Jim Fordyce, who the club uh, stuck with us for three years. And the least we could possibly do was give them a GR Rod Award <laughs> because uh, I think we lost maybe on the committee. There was a, a comparable amount, maybe probably not quite as many as, as your club had for 2018. But uh, uh, just a few people in those three years actually said we have to move on because we've got other things going on in our life. So it was very encouraging that they stuck with us. Here was one of the National Young Astronomer Awards that were presented this year. How many of you in the room, if any, are master observers for the league? This year, and we do at most Alcons, we invited the uh, uh, at master observers to come to Alcon and get the plaque to recognize your activity. And this is who we had come in here. Uh, and it was, it was strange. And of course, uh, I know in the Midwest, sometimes our observing conditions aren't as good as they are in the West and so on. And when Albuquerque told us that they were going to have, out of our 13 here, that they were going to have about 12, uh, about 10 of those that were from their club, I said, well, that's not fair. They said, well, we just happened to be in good skies. <laughs> they had to rub it in, of course. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a great honor to get them all together and recognize people who uh, have gone that extra measure. It's a grueling situation because you not only have to uh, 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 do the Messier that we were talking about earlier, you have to do uh, Herschel and uh, there, there's just a, a multitude of uh, awards you have to, uh, programs you have to include. Then we, the astronomical league tries to add something each year or two to the observer who's seen everything. They need another motivation. And so we try to do that. And we added another, uh, uh, level to the Master Observer Award last year. Uh, another two programs we've added on to that. So we try to be uh, cognizant that people do want uh, extra motivation to keep on observing. We were speaking about Apollo 17 a few minutes ago, and we were very honored to have Dr. Harrison Smith uh, at Alcon this year. And it was amazing to hear him. Uh, talk about what it was like to set foot on the moon. And uh, that was quite an experience. And we were very fortunate to have him. Uh, he is 85 years old, I believe it is right now. And you would never know it. He is up to date on everything going on in space. And he was right there. So. If you think, no, Jim Foster, no of him. That is him right there. So this year at Alcon, uh, the Motley crew got together uh, with the presidents and we had, uh, we thought we'd better do this because I don't want to be macabre, but the reason I am back as president is that we lost our former president. Uh, he died while in office. And so the new vice president uh, had been in office two months and he said, I need your help. I said, well, I retired in 2014, I'd just as soon not come back. He was insistent, so I came back. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was the group of us. We got together there. 2023, uh, here's the, the leadership of uh, the um, Baton Rouge uh, Alcon. They have a great uh, convention planned. Uh, it's a very historical part of the country, and I think you will really enjoy being there at that event. We'll have a lot more information coming in the reflector. And it's going to be June, I'm sorry, July 26th through July 29th. Astro Gumbo. And I wasn't a, a Gumbo fan until I went down scouting it out a little bit. And they convinced me it's pretty good stuff. Oh, I'm, I, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, 2024 is totally different. 
We have never done an international outcome before. And we have been in talks with RESC to see how that, what that might look like. So it's about 99% certain that the last week of June in 2024 will be in Toronto. So put the dates down now. It's going to be the last week of June. It's a little different because Canadian Independence Day, I think that's the right holiday, is on July 1st. So there's something in their charter or something that doesn't allow them to go into July. So we're having to back it up just a little bit. So we're, we're uh, heavily into the planning on that. Uh, of course, about two months before that, in what April, we have a total solar eclipse. So we're trying to make sure that we uh, have both of those events and get people to both events so they're kind of close together. Uh, what, are, what are people doing for the 2024 eclipse? Any particular places anyone might be traveling to? Texas? Excellent. I hear some, uh, the state of Arkansas is putting on a major push, uh, have been for about three years now trying to get everybody there. Uh, I could go to the boot hill of Missouri and see it, but quite frankly, I don't know that time of the year, uh, first weekend in April, gets a little iffy at times. So I don't know. Jury's still out on that. And here's some of the, uh, credits I'd like to give, Astronomical League Historical Files, Reflector Magazine, and so on and so on. That's some of the uh, borrowing I did for this article. Are any of uh, the mem uh, members here, uh, has everyone got a reflector, the September reflector so far? Okay, if you haven't, uh, my wife Betty in the back has several of those, or if you know someone who could use uh, one and you'd like to spread the word, that would be awesome. And so questions, anything you want to know about, uh, about our group? Uh, Saturday, I'll be talking about more of the uh, nitty gritty of the Astronomical League. But uh, anybody have a question on what's uh, uh, anything you want to know? Okay. If not, thank you so much. All right, there's more. You're in the right place. Yeah, ben, you, Ben can go for him. This guy's camera. And I'd like to get back. Okay. I've got a reflector. I've got a reflector. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, 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 yeah. This is a handheld now. And this is such an honor to help you celebrate the 50th anniversary of this club. Such a vibrant club. I'd like to present this to the, the uh, club. It reads, the Astronomical League congratulates the Minnesota Astronomical Society on its 50th anniversary, September 29th. 2022. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Normally drop it. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Well, that concludes our meeting tonight. Um, next month is our next meeting is November 3rd. And as I said before, I will not be here, but I will operate it remotely. So um, John and Matt, I'm sure will take care of us. Um, grab, a, grab a cupcake on your way out. Um, we, should, we should try and be out of here by 9.30. Um, just be respectful of our hosts here. Um, they're gonna wanna get in here and clean up and get set up for their tomorrow. So, um, hey, thanks for coming. Great to see everybody. And uh, 
don't forget to come out to uh, Astronomy Day on Saturday. And yeah, there's we're gonna have barbecue supper, so make sure you get your reservation. Um, I gotta talk to the caterer tomorrow, so I'd like to give him a at least fairly accurate number. So thank you all. Can we make reservations? Yes, you can make reservations, John.